Hey everybody, we just wrapped up episode 19 with Justin Hughes. It's a really cool interview. Get it? <laughs> Anyways. Hey, I just wanted to say, I wanted to do a big thank you to our viewers, our audience, our patrons. If it weren't for you guys and we didn't have such a badass audience, then we wouldn't be able to help the hundreds of thousands of vets that this is helping by bringing these stories out. And the guests too. It's helping the guests out tremendously with launching their businesses and getting their word out. So I just wanna say thank you all for that. And um, it means the world to me and everybody else involved. So love you guys. If you don't mind, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And I got a new ask. We would really appreciate it. I would personally really appreciate it. If you guys shared this episode all over social media, let's make this one go viral. All right. I hope everybody enjoys the show. And I love you guys. Seriously, thank you for everything. Cheers. One last little piece of advice that really helped me that I want to pass on to you guys before the show starts. A long time ago, a man much wiser than myself told me, no matter how bad it gets, don't eat the yellow snow. <laughs> Enjoy the show. You have to realize that life is precious, right? And it doesn't matter if you're wearing a flag on your shoulder and it's red, white, and blue red, white, and black, whatever the, whatever it is, right? Life is precious. And those people in that city were suffering. They were being persecuted because of stuff that they believed in. I just want to do bad things to bullies, right? I want to find bad people that hurt good people. Downstairs, and uh, three of my good buddies all made it. All who made it, they put their arms around me. They say, "Don't worry, Hughes. We're your brothers now." And uh, they're like, "Let's go do another evolution." We're out! Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our tier one patrons get all the behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. That could include behind the scenes photos, that could be side conversations that we have in between breaks, that could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guest on the Sean Ryan show and a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. For our tier two patrons, they get access to our tactical training library, which consists of well over a hundred videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite, mindset. 
also on tier two, you will get a live update from me on the 1st and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on the Sean Ryan Show, plus all the benefits of tier one. Our top tier, which is tier three, gets full access to all the other tiers, plus they get full access to me where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events to who's coming on the show. I take suggestions and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. Justin Hughes. Sean Ryan. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So you're a former Navy SEAL, former BUDS instructor, which is a SEAL training instructor, and now you're an artist documenting history. That's one thing. We had best. this discussion, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's kind of what we do here is document history, yeah. document, you know, modern warriors and 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 sacrifices that that the people have made yeah. on the show and, and, and it's just an honor to do it and you do it with your painting. Yeah, I try to. Well, you do a yeah. damn good job. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. So because you do such a good job, I got you a present. Oh. Oh, thanks, Sean. This is dense. We, you got any guesses? Dude. This is like a some plastic. It's not you, socks. There might be a a cup, mug, sh shirt. Damn. This is all right. Open. Gummy bears. Oh boy, some V swag, man. Thanks, Sean, dude. All right, so with the gummy bears, these are the softest, most delicious gummy bears. I have to put them on the top shelf in my house. And at 5 a.m. in the morning, the first time I came to visit you, I put all my gummy bears on the top because I don't want my kids eating them. I wake up, two bags gone. I'm like, where do my gummy bears go? I had to check my, my house camera. My kids are like pulling up chairs, putting them in the pantry, sneaking into dad's gummy bears. Snagging them, you know. I get them in the height line, chew them out. Dude, this is sick. Thank they you. have good taste. Like someone, they do have good taste. Dude, they're the best gummy bears. And I. You're probably wondering why the hell there's a paint brush in there. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay. So I want to trade you. Okay. If, if you still have the brush or a brush that you painted those two paintings. Yep. That you that 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 we exchanged. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to get two of those brushes and put them on the back of each painting. I got them. I keep every brush. Really? I Do never you throw away. Know which one? I know exactly which ones. Perfect. The print. Yeah, I won't give. I won't, Are they big I enough won't to give where them. you can sign them? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I I'll use like in the span of a painting, I'll probably use like six or seven brushes. So. I, mean, I, would, I can just bring them on and just tell you which one which ones do you want. I would love that. So, dude, thank you so much. And I, being a fan of the show and watching it pretty regularly, I brought you something. I got you a small gift. Oh, too. really? Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, so, I love for me to you. I'm flipping around. So oh. I remember your old platoon. Damn. Or at least seeing pictures of you in helos with your your patch with the with it with your shielder on it, right? Yeah, it was kind of like the logo with the Spartan helmet. And so I looked up. I think it's Greek, ancient Greek. Um, the phrase that the Spartan women would say to their men before they leave is the with it or on it, and they'd hand them their shields. And so I just wanted to create something that like kind of commemorated that platoon or that patch, that time in the team for you. And make you a little one of a one of a kind piece, 
it's still a little matte, so I need to varnish it when we uh, when I come in to do the other one. I'll, I'll do it, but this is incredible, dude. Thanks so much, man. Thank you, dude, Sean. Holy shit! Yeah, we did uh, have a patch, and that was kind of our platoon motto: was come back either with your shield or on it, and yeah. and then and then after that platoon, that saying kind of went everywhere. It's fire, yeah. but it Blue originated up. with our platoon. <coughs> That's and, right. Uh, damn, dude! Thank you. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks. I actually had the helmet. The helmet was made by a company in Italy that still makes like the original Corinthian helmets, and I ordered one in bronze. So I photographed it, painted it all from uh, my own references, and created. Damn, it. it's pretty sick. It this is good. very cool. Yeah, thanks. One more time for the for the audience. Wow, thank you. Thank you, man. All right, so you ready to dive in? Yeah, let's get into it. Details. Ready? Yeah. All ready? right, yeah. it's gonna be a long one. All right. But uh, starting off, we, I give Patreon, uh, I tell them who's coming on the show, I told them about you. I've been waiting for you to come on here for a long time, as Thanks. you know. Thank you. And uh, it's an honor to have you in the room, finally, in the hot seat. And uh, so anyways, I give Patreon the opportunity to ask questions as you know we just did a behind the scenes yep. uh, piece and so but I wanted to save two that I thought were were good questions uh, for the actual for the actual show here so this is from Jeffrey Kalnan how has his combat experience influenced his artistic expression Jeffrey um, you know I think for good storytelling and accurate storytelling you have to have some kind of experience with the subject that you're handling, right? I think that's why we see a lot of filmmakers go to different locations to do research. Writers dig into certain subjects and study law so that they can be accurate in the things that they're talking about, right? And for me, in art and combat, I think it helps with my subject matter that I enjoy painting, which is kind of around that warrior archetype, specifically modern warfare and in our military now, just to capture some of those intricacies and, and details that might get lost if another artist painted it, right? So for instance, the last painting that I did for you, the one of you guys in the sniper hide, the, the mesh that's shielding you guys from public view, another artist might not know what that's for and they might have painted it blocked in or it might not have had the detail that I think was necessary for it, right? Because you're shooting through it and it, it shields you from them at a distance, but not, not enough for you to be able to look through it and, and see what's going on. So I think that it's influenced my artistic expression in that I can capture some of those intricacies of the job and highlight what's important and in what we're doing versus the details that don't necessarily matter as much. Does that make sense? It does. Hopefully that helps Jeffrey. And you do a phenomenal job at it. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. So one more question. Yeah. This is from Mark Doubt. After hearing you talk about missing the people you are you were in the ship with, does paintings like this make you miss these times more? So I'm not sure if that question was directed at <laughs> me or if that question was directed at you, yeah. but you go ahead. Let's do it. Let's both do it. You go first. All right. Um, does it make me miss the guys? Absolutely. You know, and <clears throat> I'm often looking through old pictures of me and the guys and thinking about, you know, what, what kind of story could I tell here? And... And a lot, of, a lot of the guys that I worked with are still serving. So I know that maybe that's a story that I'll have to save for another time and with their permission, of course. But uh, I can't help but look at the images that even that I've captured for you. And despite that we were in different countries, or really same, both Iraq and Yemen, right? Yeah. We're in different countries, different times. I can't help but remember going into Yemeni cop markets, right? Or yeah. like being on rooftops in Iraq and having those same memories with guys and coking and joking on, and maybe a little bit situations that should be very, very serious, but 
you know, finding laughter in the small things. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, it makes me miss them greatly, but I'm also very happy with where I'm at now. And I think it's important for guys like us to kind of remember the community, but also figure out a way that we can, we can move on from it and tell a different story. Right? That's a good and answer. Do something different. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. I look at that and uh, <clears throat> two guys I'm with right there. I don't miss them. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that was about when were you in Yemen? Uh, 2014. 2000. We might have been there at the same time. Really? That photo may have been taken when you were in country. Shut up. No I was bullshit. like next door buying. Bullets in the weapons market. Nice. While you were buying cotton. Drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's crazy. But no, it did, you know, and then the one behind me with uh, my two sniper partners, the guy next to me, uh, both of those were very good friends of mine. And uh, I don't know, you know, kind of like what you just said, I've been out for a long time now. Yeah. It's been, it's, we're creeping up on damn near 20 years. Uh, since I was in the SEAL teams, wow. and and I used to miss it a lot, you know. Yeah. But like you, I'm I'm in a good place now, and I really enjoy what I'm doing, yeah. and and I think what we're doing here is really important. And so I don't know if it really makes me miss them that much. Sometimes I miss the feeling, but I will say when I look at your art, you know, that you've done of me, those two pieces, it. It takes me like right back to that yeah, very cool. moment. That's I awesome. can remember exactly what we were doing, both on that rooftop, and I can remember exactly what we were doing yeah. when we were in that cop market. So it just it just reminds me of good times, you know. Yeah. Good times, hard times. It's kind of like a whole slew of emotions and memories and. And just a in the snap. You go back, yeah. Yeah. Quick. You know, and it's 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 really cool. All what I would say the emotion is 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 it's all good. Yeah. You know, it's I'm it was a good time in my life, but it was a different time in my life. Yeah, exact I think that's something that a lot of guys struggle with. Well, maybe they don't struggle with it as much as you hear that a lot, right? I miss I miss the guys. I miss the community. But at the same time, the the same guy that's saying that also chose to leave the the community, yeah. right, for a reason. And there's there's a lot of different reasons behind. I think everybody's story is a little bit maybe a little bit different. There's I'm sure there's similarities on a lot of fronts. But <clears throat> when you make that decision, guys aren't doing it whimsy nilly. Like yeah. they know what they're leaving behind. So. I miss the guys. I miss the community. I miss the camaraderie and joking around. I miss working with that kind of team. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy, man. I'm glad I'm. I glad, I'm glad I left. Good. You know, so I'm happy to hear that. I, since we're on the subject, so, yeah. before we dive into your backstory, I, yeah. I think that is something that a lot of guys, I think it, myself included, uh, when I got out, it wasn't just traumatic experiences and right. and all that kind of stuff and the addiction to adrenaline. But you're also you're operating at the highest level, and and there's a lot of with with that comes a lot of external influence from you know people, yeah. you know, society as a whole. I mean, they make TV shows about mm -hmm. what we used to do, SEAL Team. Yeah. You know, they make movies about what we used to do, and and, and people just respect that level of where we were at so much that it kind of uh it kind of gets to you you know kind of yep. it kind of gets to you and when you leave it it there's almost like this worry that it's like how am i going to reach Definitely. the level right. that i was at in 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 another aspect of life that's mm -hmm. not necessarily as an operator and and I think, you know, we've both found it. You found it through your art, which is, I keep saying it, but it is fucking amazing. And you. and I found it through this show and, and, and well, that's it, this yeah. show, you know? And, and, uh, and so it, I think that that plays a big role in, in 
some of the stress that goes right. on after the leave. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, finding purpose. Yeah, I think to the man, and they have a bunch of programs now for <clears throat> seals, other soft guys getting out of the community to kind of reintegrate them into the the business world or whatever world they're kind of interested in, you know, kind of helping them to transition and finding what they're interested in. And I think almost the man, the hardest, the hardest spot thing, to, not to the man, but most men, the hardest thing they find is not their work ethic or their ability to do it, do a good job at something. It's how do you find fulfillment and purpose in something outside of the teams because because you leave and you want to have passion about some other job as much as you had about the day that you knew that you wanted to be a navy seal right and you feel like i'm le i feel like called to leave the teams i should have have that yeah. for something else but it just doesn't it doesn't happen and it's hard to pinpoint so but we i mean i have my own journey with that you have yours i'm sure everybody has their own thing their own stuff but I'm, I'll get into the details of mine in the, when we get to that point in the interview, if you want. Perfect. Yeah. Well, let's start the interview. Sweet. So, you know, kind of how we want to do it is start with childhood, get into the SEAL teams, get heavy into your uh, combat experience with ISIS. I can't wait to dive into that. Yeah. Um, I haven't really explored that with anybody. We did a little bit with Eddie Gallagher, but yeah. you have a lot of experience <clears throat> dealing with ISIS, and, and I can't wait to dive into that. And Because I didn't fight them like you did. It was the old school enemies uh, when I was in, and then right. you know ISIS developed. And then into your transition and, and to the arts. So art stuff. Yeah. let's start with where, where'd you grow up? The very beginning. When I was the before time when I was a speckle in my father's a wee eye. Wee little lad. Yeah, just a wee little lad. Well, uh, I was born into a military family. My father was an Army Huey pilot, and he flew in Panama and Desert Storm, Desert Shield in the late '80s, early '90s. And so, as a young kid, my dad was gone a lot, and I grew up with just him, kind of in and out. But definitely, I remember looking up to him, coming back in his flight jacket. You know, as like. I remember five, four or five years old or something. And during some mission, I've, I don't really know the details, but there was some kind of malfunction in, in his engine, had a hard landing, destroyed his back, and he got out. <clears throat> My father felt kind of called towards, you know, missions or, or some higher calling, and he ended up going to seminary um, to to be a pastor and while he was at seminary uh, my family felt called to go to Southeast Asia how old were you at, that at time? this time I want to say when he started seminary I must have been six probably was he religious before that he was okay so yeah. it wasn't from a specific event that happened yeah. no, no no yeah he was he was religious before that but he would tell you even like he he wanted to do some kind of missions work but he was the the missions organizations that he was trying to work for weren't hiring young men that weren't married. So he's like, you know what? God, just give me give me five years to do it to join the military or something. And he'll admit like that is be joined out of like kind of anger and selfishness. And but ultimately, well, like his, his story is completely different. He ended up going getting out, going back into chaplaincy and. Um, back in the army just retired out of the army so yeah crazy um that answer your question yeah. yeah so kind of going back going to seminary we do like these family meetings every night you know after dinner time we'd get together and i remember my mom and dad sitting down and was like guys your dad and i are thinking about going to southeast asia and moving out there and helping some people I'm like that sounds kind of cool they're like, nobody's going to speak our language. We're going to be the only people like us there. It's like, okay. They're like, it'll be dangerous. I'm like, I like danger. That sounds exciting. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm completely naive. I don't know what any of this means. And uh, they're like, the food will be different. I'm like, okay, I kind of like foreign food. 
<laughs> and uh, and so far, and so far, <laughs> they're like, so you know, we don't want this just to be a decision about us. I have an older brother, a little sister. Like, if you guys, if this isn't something that you guys think that you'd want to do, like we we don't want to do it, but we want this to be a part, a kind of a family decision. And I'm thinking, this sounds just like Tarzan. You know, like this is, <laughs> like I am gonna be, you know, Mowgli wandering around the bush, like pet tiger, like toucan on my shoulder or something, I don't know. And uh, of course, you know, like a little kid, like you tell me how, if we're gonna move over to this place, it sounds awesome, you know? And so of course, a month later, my parents come in, like, hey guys, what do you, th like, have you guys thought about that stuff? And I'm like, I'm in. Little sister, yeah, I think that's, that's a good idea. We're all, you know, older brother, like, we want to do it. So we're like, all right, we're going to do it. And so at age seven, <clears throat> about to turn eight, we moved to Southeast Asia. And it was so cool, dude. It was awesome childhood. Uh, the kind of stuff that we were doing, a lot of it, Looking back, it's kind of crazy at my career field now, but a lot of it was just going out into villages, mapping villages that were not documented or mapped, doing population, like checking populations, roads, in and out, routes, like backpacking routes to these villages, and then bringing in medical supplies, dental supplies to some of these villages. And so as a kid, you know, I'm out backpacking with my brother and my sister and my mom in small teams. You're out there to, doing the Green Beret mission. doing stuff with, with my family. Yeah, how cool is that? So at a, young, at a young age, my family and my brothers and sisters, we were all kind of forced to adopt a, a calling that was like pretty high level, right? Because what we were doing was definitely not, not like not actually legal. And the, the government was not very pro what our mission was, if that makes sense. And, and I remember police raids on our house. Um, really? Searching, yeah, I remember our lights being wiretapped and going into hotel rooms and then being wired, staying at different places. So it was, it was, a, it was an environment where <clears throat> just starting out, like as we, as we were about to leave, you learn as a kid not to say certain words, right? Like you, somebody asks what your parents do, you have a cover, like you, you say something else, right? And, uh, and people would test you in these, like these, they, they, we go to like a little training camp. People would, random people would come up to you in the lunch line, like, hey, what, are your, what do your parents do? And you know, if you messed up, you, somebody told your parents, parents came, talked to you, and kind of guide you and train you through this because you, you get over there and you get wrapped up for some of the stuff that you're doing. It's like espionage. Yeah. You know? And so that was kind of kind of my childhood starting out at 8 to 10. So at 8 um, years old, you're learning how to live a cover story? Yeah, man. How crazy is that? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't all that, dude. It was, it, there was a lot of fun. My father is a great outdoorsman. He was a hunter, but guns and firearms are illegal here. So my brother and I are making like blow dart guns and crossbows to try to go out and hunt. And really the only thing <laughs> in our environment is one of those things from that TV show, like r rodents, like r rodents of unusual size, R-O-U-S, R-O-U-S. You know what I'm talking about, Princess Bride? I haven't seen no? it. Oh, geez. Right. Princess Bride, Princess the movie? Bride. Yeah, yeah, you know the movie? There's oh, like the man. giant rats that attack yeah. and eat people. Like, that was the only animal we could hunt out there, was just like these huge, huge rats. And so, my bro dude, we got very resourceful, and we went full indage. We had blow dart guns. We were setting snares, and uh, we were catching these rats. And we got, like, really good at it. And... It got to the point, I think in like the span of like three or four months, we'd killed like 200 plus rats. Damn. It got so good, like we got good that like the local government was hearing how good we were and came to ask if we could go in and, and help clear out some rats from the government, dude, in, in, in like the, in the capital, bro. 
Wow. Yeah, it was sick. And our courtyard was like lined with skins. You know, we were like putting them on stretch racks, stretching out these rats. Yeah, I don't, dude, I don't, we went full and weird. It was like Lord of the Flies meets something. I don't know. So how many <laughs> how many Americans were there? That it was just you guys. Um, when we first moved there, it was us, and I think there was one other family, um, American family that was located, not like in the same area, but like out in another in another village. So where were you guys passing information to then? If you were mapping these these villages and, and <coughs> documenting population, and where does I that think, information I th- go? Uh, so. I, these are like kind of details that I wasn't really privy to, but I know that they had like their own, like people would come in country and visit, and you'd essentially, it could be word of mouth, mm. letters, or I think the internet was kind of around back then, so they had some kind of way to pass information. I remember internet being in its like very infancy, my dad having a computer and okay and doing some of that stuff, so. I don't know what, like if they were at VPNs or what that looked like back then. Do you know where supplies came from? Uh, smuggled in country. Smuggled? Yep, a lot of them. What was the cover? So, um, do, it was like random. People would drive stuff in, uh, different rat lines. A lot of it was just like Bibles, little tracks in, in, the, in the local language. And one of the in the village that we lived in a lot in a lot of these places different villages have different dialects so a lot of what one of the families was doing was just trying to learn the language so that they could translate the bible into into their language so that that people could actually have and read a Hmm. bible so that's kind of what that looks like or you it could just be a medical office and sometimes they could come in under you know they were like doing medicine in, in a village nobody really cares but you do medicine pull somebody's tooth and they'd be like why why are you here like what are you doing I'm like, my own government doesn't do this for me you know it's yeah. like, well you know we believe that Jesus loved you so much that he came and died for you and he taught us to love God and to love people this is just our way of loving you you know and they'd be like okay Bye. Thanks for the tooth pull. Or they could be like, tell me more about this Jesus. Yeah. You know? Interesting. I didn't realize yeah. that, I mean, I've heard a lot of people that, you know, that go on the missions and stuff, and I didn't realize it was that you were that embedded. I kind of thought it was just a well-groomed, well-greased machine. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize it was, that's cool. Yeah. I And I debated when I was first kind of jotting down all these notes. I was like, oh, I can just talk openly about it all. And then I went on, I said, surely somebody else has written a book or talked about this stuff, like the details. And I Googled it, and I'm looking at the area that I lived in, and all the images are like of old dead people, and they're in black and white. So it's a very secretive community. Hmm. And I, I mean, I just grown up kind of taking it for advantage, I guess. I, I didn't really realize how quiet like they all were, right? That's uh, pretty wild. Very interesting. Yeah, and I don't and I don't think it's always that case for every group. I know some countries are more open to it than others. Like I lived in Thailand, you could openly practice your religion. You know, they had churches there that you could go to in the open. But where I was, it was definitely like can't say Christian. We don't say missionary. You what was the primary about. religion then? Where I was living, yeah, uh, Buddhism. Buddhism. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so how long did you do like that? Did you, was it from eight to eighteen? Uh, uh, yeah, I came back for college. You went to college after, yeah, what, after the mission. What were you we studying? That. I studied international relations okay. first. Yeah, go we, can go, we can go into that. We can go into that a little bit. But so going from there. Um, to the, I had an incident where me and my sister were racing. I was running back to the house. There, the the door to kind of like the compound that I was living one in was it was like a glass door, and you know those push bars that like lock. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It was one of those. I pushed pushed on the door with my left hand, 
my at the same time my sister we were like dead sprint kind of stepped on the back of my shoe and I slid forward and my hand went through the glass door I grabbed the glass ripped my hand out looked down and my hands just split open and I think my parents at the time the town had just gotten a washing machine or something so they were going to check it out see if they could buy it and immediately I'm just like look at my sister I'm like this is bad you know I go in and fortunately there were two nurses that were visiting a couple that were that were there and they came out right when it happened dude and he immediately saw just blood like cover him down my arm he fortunately got a, a cloth on it started applying pressure to it we ran out into the, the local hospital there <clears throat> and the medicine there wasn't very advanced so I remember them saying word had gotten to my parents they came met us at the hospital they were kind of like cleaning it the doctors were assessing it doctors told my parents hey like we don't have medicine to put him to sleep so we're gonna have to do this under was it like local anesthesia or you just mm -hmm. numb the area like we're gonna have to put him under local anesthesia and we're gonna have to do this like why he's awake and dude they pulled out like the this wooden cork dowel put it in my mouth I had like a band go around my neck back on the other side they put like a little oxygen in my nose yeah and we got on the table he opened it up dude it's just like arterial bleeding squirting out of my hand and I pass out and I come to in the surgery I'm yelling and screaming dude and I look down and I see t this guy's pulling on like this white thing on my wrist and I'm seeing my fingers moving like that he's like pulling on my like ligaments and tendons and stuff messing with stuff and I look at my mom my mom's in this, she's in the room with me I'm like mom and I'm just out of it like is it my right hand or my left hand she's like it's your left hand I said oh I can still draw you know and uh pass out wake up bleed and I just see blood all over a towel I'm like mom my mouth is so dry am I gonna die from this she's like I don't know you know like how hard must that have been from my mother sorry damn how old yeah. were you 10 10 years old yeah, 10 years old so I wake up my hands like wrapped up in this cast and I just remember my mouth just being so dry it's just like water. My dad comes over. He's like, buddy, hey, here's some water. You know, gets me some water. He's like, hey, don't worry. We're going to get you out. Like, we're, we're going back. We're going somewhere where we got good doctors. It's like, what happened? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, that was not cool, you know? Yeah. And so he's like, we got a plane. You, you know, we're going to get you. We're going to fly you out to Hong Kong. They have really good doctors. They're going to take another look at this thing. It's not over, you know, and uh, fly out to Hong Kong. They open it back up, make sure everything's good. It cut the artery and like some of the ligaments and stuff. So fix up some of that stuff. Because of that, I needed like a little bit of rehab. So we hung out in Hong Kong for a bit. <clears throat> and my family was like, you know, maybe, maybe we could start getting our kids in the school system getting them socialized with some other kids. It might be a good break for them. So they were looking at kind of international schools around the area, and they decided on Penang, Malaysia. And so we moved out to Malaysia, and I went to an international school there. And it, the, it was really cool, very tropical, on a little island, and a good community, uh, lots of Canadians, uh, you know, just people from all over. Malaysia used to be... Um, British territory. So there's a lot of British influence. It's very modern. And this school that I was going to is just kind of a melting pot, just all sorts of people. Hmm. They spoke English there, which was great. And then 9 11 happened. And um, Malaysia has a heavy population of Muslims. And I remember seeing, you know, the tower. My uncle calls. It's like, hey, he was in the country at the time. 
uncle calls he's like hey tell your dad to turn on the tv turn it on tower's on fire i'm like dude what is that why are there buildings on fire i think i'm in sixth grade or something yeah sixth grade and my brother is watching he's like that's a terrorist attack I'm like what what are terrorists <laughs> you know and he's kind of like they're people that like you know kind of just described it like a 10 year i don't really remember uh and right then boom the next hour hits and i'm like i gotta tell my teacher she's an american you know so i call her i'm like hey miss tice look at the news there's a terrorist attack and uh she turns it on she's like oh my and <clears throat> because of the muslim population and our school being an international school immediately we started getting bomb and terrorist threats on our school and so our school you started shut down. getting bombed bomb and terrorist threats okay. at the school so our school shut down for a week and they were kind of assessing the situation the embassy was kind of like talking to you know everybody was kind of like trying to figure out what what happens next yeah and i remember school opening back up and this kid coming up to me he's like hey justin dude there's marines here is that what like is that like the army you know he's like no he's a canadian kid he's like no marines man they're like you know I'm, i've grown up overseas i know like army the Navy, my grandpa was Navy, but I didn't really know too much about the military. He's like, no, they're like over there. And I like went over, went over to him. I'm like, sir, why are you here? He's got his American flag patch on his shoulder. He's like, got, I think he's got like a dip in. I don't know what it is at the time. But he's like, you American kid? And I said, yes, sir. And he's like, I'm here because of you. I said, me? What did I, I didn't. I didn't do anything. He's like, no. I said, a lot of people don't like us, buddy. I said, I'm here. Sorry. It's funny because this stuff doesn't hit you when you're a kid. Like you're like, oh, cool. It's like I'm here in case you need to be rescued. Damn. Dude, they were doing like maritime ops because my school was located on the beach. Like they were doing maritime ops, like doing dry runs on the beach, like getting ready in case they ever needed to pull Americans out. And I just remember thinking, they care about me. They don't even know me. Why do I, like, this place was owned by British. The British aren't here. There's Canadians here. The Canadians aren't here. The Malaysian government's not here. Americans. That means something, right? Yeah. So immediately, dude, I'm like, I'm fired up, dude. I'm like, oh, I love being an American. You know, the Marines are here. Like, talk to my grandma next time on the phone. I'm like, grandma, I want you to send me anything that's American. I want American flags. I want American t shirts. You know, and I'm like, so freaking proud. Because, like, these dudes didn't know me and they were willing to risk their lives to come rescue me. You know, a little six year old. And it's funny because, like, back then, I remember being like super proud, but now I get like, I get choked up because it's so, it's like, you know, I'm proud of that shit. And, uh, and so my grandma sends me a box, you know, it's like American flag t shirts, little flags that you wave, and I stick one in my backpack and go into class. Canadian teacher's like, Justin, come here. Like, yes, ma'am. She says, Did you see the memo that? I don't know if this accent is terrible. She's like, you see the memo school put out? Did your parents get that? I said, I don't know. She's like, well, look, it's saying that you need to be careful wearing paraphernalia that has your country and that says where you're from. And I'm like, Why? I look down and it's like American flag and it says these colors don't run underneath it. You know? <laughs> I'm like, can I have that? And so she says, yeah, take it home to your parents. Take it home to my dad. I'm like, dad, my teacher says, that I can't wear stuff with American flags on it, you know? He's like, give me that. He looks at it and he's like, all right, here's the deal. You don't wear it out in town, but you wear as much stuff as you want between home and school, you know? I was like, yeah. Like, America, <laughs> you know, you don't really care. Like, I'm just stoked. Um, so that was Malaysia after 
couple years living there. I mean, it, what's up? How, did, how long did it take for that to die down? Or did um, it ever die down? <clears throat> I remember, like, for months after, like, talking, the school was doing contingencies for if something happened. I remember, like, building weapons with my friends and, like, storing them around the school. You know? Really? We were thinking, like, dude, if somebody comes, we're not going to the basketball court like they want us to. You know, we're like, we're going to the tree line. We're going to create these baseball bats. Like, it's like, dude, we were coming up with all sorts of stuff. We're going to steal baseball bats from the gym. And then we're going to get, like, nails. And we're going to stick them in the baseball bats. And we were planting weapons around the school. You know, like, we're going to go out into the trees. And we're going to, like, sur- like, we're getting out of the school. We're not hanging out here, you know. And you, you're just talking. You're talking yeah. trash and making plans. You know, dreaming as a kid. And... Uh, I think it died down. You, you get comfortable, and you kind of lose track of time, and you kind of forget a little bit of that stuff. But I want to say, like, my whole last year, it was kind of in the back of everybody's mind. Everybody was like, from that point on, I remember in Malaysia just being a lot more alert and being a lot more aware of my surroundings. And it wasn't so much anymore about the government. It was just about, ev- like, more suspicious about everybody. Yeah. So... The, your whole outlook just changes on the entire population now. It's not just government officials or people wearing uniform or certain buzzwords because I'm a white face in a place where there aren't a whole lot of white faces, right? And that's in, you're instantly a target. That answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> from there, we I think we lived there for like three years, and then I moved back to our previous house. And after so long on the mission field, you're, you get, uh, it's called like furlough. So depending on the amount of time that you spent, you either get six months or a year. And so my family, because of the t- amount of time we spent, we were granted a year back in the States to go back. And this is my freshman year in high school. For some reason, we went to some small town in Alabama. And I was so excited because I'm going back to America. And I'm, I'm pumped to be there, you know back on the homeland I can say Christian I get to go to church I get to worship in public I can talk about anything I want in America and we're all on the same team right and I get to public school and I'm bullied you know and and I remember thinking like we're on the same team you know it's like what the like what on earth it's like you're you're an American I'm an American like why aren't why don't we value each other? Why don't we like have compassion for one another? Like, what are you, what are you picking on me for? Because I'm smaller than you, you know. And I, from dude, I hate bullies, <laughs> right? And I promise, I remember leaving after my final year, just being like, if I ever see that shit, and I can, I'm gonna stop it, right? So, my parents, you know, they <clears throat> they see kind of like that 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 experience like affected me, and they're like, you know, maybe like secluding him and like getting him alone isn't necessarily the the best thing. Or like putting him back in that environment is the best thing. Maybe we like should get him in, back in an international school, so that would be good for him when we move back. And so we. I moved to Thailand. I went to boarding school in Thailand. My parents kind of went out in the mission field, and I lived away from them for about a year. And <clears throat> I got in a little bit of trouble with the school. Uh, I just felt like I had a, like a lot of mobility and freedom in my youth, and the school system was like very controlling and manipulative, mm-hmm. and I didn't jive well with it so my parents were like this is, actually this is not a good environment for him <laughs> like, maybe we'll just move to Thailand for a little bit and and we'll kind of finish out our time in the mission field here until he goes that like our kids are all off in college and then uh, I went into college you met your so, wife there right oh yeah yeah sorry very important part <laughs> yeah so my wife's family was missionaries to India and her story was kind of like the same as mine. They kind of sent her to the same boarding school in Thailand. 
and we kind of crossed paths. We were completely different social groups, and we didn't really interact until like my senior year. And we dated our senior year, and then ended up going to the same college, um, just because the college that I went to had a special program for missionary kids because our parents made nothing. They pretty much give you a nice scholarship as long as your parents are serving overseas. And so we both kind of ended up in the same spot because of like the mm. financial issue. And I knew that I wanted to serve, but I just didn't know what that looked like or like what that, at what capacity. My father was very adamant about me going to college. I was interested in enlisting, but from a young age, he was always like, hey man, I think, it's, I think it'll be really good for your, your growth and your maturity for you to go to college first, kind of give you an opportunity to figure out the states again, and then kind of make a plan when you're doing that. And with the college, with the, with the scholarship, me not paying for anything, it seemed like a, like a pretty good deal. You know, and so I, I went to college in Virginia, and I was I was looking at the degrees, just studying international relations, and I, was, I, was, I remember like not being a good student, and I really didn't want to study anymore. I, it wasn't really a good environment for me, because. <clears throat> I knew I just wanted to join the military, and I didn't know how some of these these things that I was studying was gonna like really translate. And I'm naive, of course, but I know it all it all has its has a purpose. But I went to uh, I was talking to my dad, kind of wrestling with this, like, Dad, I kind of really want to just join the military. He's like, Well, dude, why don't you look at ROTC? I said, Oh, what? What is that? Is it? It's like He's like, it's an officer training. So you go to the, you, you do like college classes, you do some like military training while you're in school, you can contract and they'll even pay you. And then when you finish, you're a commissioned officer. I was like, that's sick. So I went onto the, you know, website. We had Army ROTC. I'm like, dude, I'm going to try out Army ROTC. And started the classes. And before, before I join, I'm looking at all these jobs in the Army, and I'm like, special forces, you know, this, this looks like, this looks like my childhood, you know, it, it just seems like a perfect fit. With the language, the foreign experience, like, this might really work. But I was a terrible student. I wasn't in good shape. I wasn't an athlete. <clears throat> and I remember going into... Like it was like the first day or whatever, you know, there's a ton of other students. And them going around, it's like, hey, you know, we'd like to get to know you guys. Everybody, if you wouldn't mind, stand up and tell us about why you're joining the military, why you want to be a part of the military. And I have nothing against, like, if you sign the line and you join and you served in this nation's military, absolutely honorable, you know, like, like, I'm freaking proud of you but when most of these classmates of mine stood up it was oh I want the job experience I need the college money it's like I, I think that this career will help me when I get out in the mm -hmm. business world and I think maybe two or two or three other guys that were in my class with me just said I want to do good things for my country and I want to do bad things to bad people, you know? And I was like, shoot, man. Where, where are all my people at, you know? Yeah. Like, where's my community? Because I don't think this is, I don't really connect like that, you know? I only, like, I just want to do bad things to bullies, right? I want to find bad people that hurt good people. Like, all right, well, maybe I, I sh like, I just really got to push and try to be special forces. And and the more I'm like looking into it, and I'm looking at the rating system that the that the program was built off of, I'm like, dude, the ch even if I 
get the job, the chances of me becoming an officer in that community, slim to none. You know, and I'm like, I don't want to bet that. It's like, I think I might just have to enlist. And, and it got to the point where my father and mother were coming off the mission field, so my scholarship was going to drop. So I knew I had three options. One, I go into massive debt, finish my degree, try to commission somehow. Two, I could get a scholarship with ROTC. They'd pay for the rest of my schooling, and I'd risk it to try to go SF. Three, I get out, and I just enlist. And <clears throat> I remember a summer break. During the summers in college, I was a raft guide. And uh, actually right here in Tennessee on the Pigeon River. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And so I'd go out and raft guide. Well, one summer, um, I was linking up with one of my buddies before I went out in, in Alabama. And he's like, dude. And I was telling him my, my situation I'm kind of looking at. You know, and he's older than me. He's like, oh, man, you're looking at that? He's like, you got to read this book. He's like, what, what is it? And he's like, it's called Lone Survivor. It's about Navy SEALs. He said, I think I've heard of them. Yeah, like, Navy SEALs. I just had not, I, like, Navy was never an option. It's like, I think I remember, like, somebody talking about Navy SEALs once. And uh, he's like, oh, dude, you got to read this book. And I was like, okay. And and I went, I went. He I, he gave me his copy of the book, and I just like downed it, and I was like, dude, the way the way that these men compose themselves, freaking the bravery, how tough Danny Dietz was, right? Axelson, Murph, Latrell, dude, it like, like, it's like, that's tough, you know. That's what men are. I said, and then, you know, of course, you're like, what do you have to do to do this? So you Google, like, Navy SEAL training, what is that? And then you see the training, you're like, that's the, this is the hardest thing in the world. And I'm like, if it's the hardest and the toughest, that means that the men that want to be there are the men like, like, they're like me, right? I said, if they're the strongest, Then they win the most, right? And I was like, they can they can kill the most bullies. <laughs> yeah. And so <clears throat> that was there, and like that seed was planted. And uh, so I, I I went back to college. It was kind of like my last semester to decide. And I was telling some of my classmates, and I remember being in a car, and they're like, everybody's talking about what they want to do in the army. And. It was, it was the first time I kind of verbalized it to this group. And this girl's like, how about you, Hughes? What do you want to do? And I was like, I think I want to be a SEAL or Special Forces. And she looks at me. She looks down at me, kind of scrolls me. She's like, you know, that's really hard, right? And I was like, I want to be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> like, I, my <laughs> the point was made. <laughs> Like now I want, that's all I want to do. Like, I'm going to do this, you know? It's like Team America. He's like, I promise I will never die, right? Like, <laughs> dude, I was like, like, F what everybody else thinks. Like, I'm gonna do everything I can to do this job. And so I started training that semester and I'm talking to my brother who's out of college now. He's raft guiding at the, uh, in Charlotte, the US National White Water Center. I'm like, dude, Signed up for classes for next semester, my senior year. And I was like, but I'm not, I'm not going. I said, I'm gonna enlist. I'm talking to a special forces recruiter. I'm been, I know that there's like, like seal contracts now. I think I'm gonna try it out. I'm gonna like, you know, I'm gonna, I want to talk to them and see what the best option, what they think the best option is for me. And uh, he's like, dude, come on down to Charlotte. You can be a raft guide at the at the Whitewater Center, and. Uh, and you can kind of figure it out, man. Hang out with me. I'm like, all right, cool. Because he was looking at the intelligence community and <clears throat> and going the officer route and either the Navy, like preferably the Navy, he, he was kind of leaning to. And I was like, all right, yeah, we can go talk to the recruiter together. And so I remember walking in to the recruiting office. I'm like, all right, first I'm going to go into the, the Army office. 
office. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to go talk to the Navy office. Walk into the door. Army office is on the right. Navy office is on the left. Army office is closed. Hard left of the Navy office, dude, and I never looked back. No good. Yeah. My brother is in there chatting with them, and uh, I'm kind of like sitting in the back on my phone waiting my turn. And he's like, yeah, honestly, man, is it GM1 Ramos? Freaking awesome. Like, if you had a, like, a recruiter that was cool, GM1 Ramos was like just a character. And uh, <laughs> he's like, we're not really like recruiting like officers right now. He's like, probably, like, He's like, honestly, like what the military really want, like what the Navy really, really wants. It's like SEALs, EOD, and I was like, oh, that's what my brother wants to do. And he's like, you know, look at, <laughs> <laughs> you, come here. You wanna be a Navy SEAL? So I, I'm interested. Yeah, I'd like to talk about it. He's like, you swim? So I'm okay. He's like, you run? I'm like, yeah, I wanna be a Navy SEAL or, you know, Talk about it, <laughs> and uh, he's like, "All right, let's uh, let's do the PST tomorrow." I said, "Okay." He's like, "You want to do it?" Looked at my brother. My brother's like, "Yeah, I'll try it." And so, dude, we go to do the PST, and I had been swimming, but I don't know if it was the pressure or the tides weren't right, but I felt like I was going to drown. Like mm -hmm. it was a miserable experience. It was like a total gut check for me. I was, I, I mean, you can ask my wife what I was, I'm a skinny dude, you know, and I'm 140 pounds at this point, just tiny. And uh, and I, pa I passed everything, but it hurt, right? And I was like, dude, I suck, you know, I'm, I'm like trash. And I'm like, hey man, listen, like you kind of kissed me on the first date. It's like, I need to like go train a little bit for this if I'm gonna like really take it seriously. And, <clears throat> and I got in the car with my brother and I was like, dude, that sucked. And he's like, yeah. And my brother's like, dude, I kinda wanna do this too. No shit. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, should we do that? Like, sh should we do this? And I said, dude, it'll, it's, it'll be hard. He's like, yeah, I know. I said. No, it's gonna be really hard. He's like, I know. He's like, it'll be dangerous. He's like, I know. <laughs> it's like, nobody's gonna speak our language. Yeah, same deal. And uh, the food's gonna be different. And and he's like, let's do it. I said, let's let's be Navy SEALs. And that was like Rocky montage number one, right? Every day I'm in the pool. We're on the Versa climber. You know, lifting weights, trying to get into shape, and then, you know, end up getting our contract, shipping off to Buds. Both of so you guys? Shipped off to Buds together. Same boot camp division, same Buds class. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. So your older brother, just on a whim, decided in that moment, like, yeah, fuck it, I'll give this a <laughs> shot. No, I mean, he he had the same sense that I did, right, yeah. in, in loyalty to our country and a desire to do great things for this nation. And and he wasn't sure what capacity he was gonna do it at. I knew that I wanted to be some sort of soft. Yeah. Um, and I knew that I was drawn towards the training of the SEAL teams. I didn't do a whole lot of research, but I knew I really, like, that was very appealing to me, that it was so hard. And he, he was interested, but it wasn't something that, like, for years he had been kind of working up towards to go into that community. And wow. so, yeah, it was just kind of like, you want to do it? It's like, yeah, let's go. Damn. So we full send, man. That is a hell of a childhood to Bud's yeah, story. Wow, wild. I totally wasn't expecting any of that. Really? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing out there on you I could have researched, you yeah, know? and uh, black. <laughs> you're, you know, you'll appreciate this. You're a black... You're a blank canvas. Dude. So, you nice. know, but. See what you did there. But hey, before we uh, get into buds, let's yeah. take a quick break. Right on. What's going on, Patreon? Join me on Vigilance Elite Patreon 
for a live video teleconference. All right, so we had a nice little break there. Yeah. Let's get into you and your brother are getting ready to show up to Bud's. Yep. So Rocky one montage done, going to the fight, right? We're going to Bud's together. Ship off to boot camp, and boot camp was nothing like I expected. Uh, fortunately, you know, my brother's just a couple racks away from me. So starting out my time in the Navy, it was, it was awesome just having like that touch point, right? At the end of the day, we could always debrief, debrief each other and be like, dude, Like, this, this is way worse than what we thought it was going to be like. I think this instructor cadre is, like, beating, like, abusing us. Like, it was, it was like, dark. You know, we, we went to a dark place. I don't know. Maybe it was just completely out of our element. But it just wasn't what I expected from boot camp. And, um, you know, I joke. It's like, dude, I would rather do Buds again than boot camp. It was just so freaking stupid and monotonous. Uh, I think, I'll, like... A lot of times when I bring that up to students, they're like, yeah, boot camp's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just like the creature comforts that you're giving away. And at least in Buds, I know like on the weekend. Well, yeah, you see the... Like a little bit. Yeah, maybe you chime in a little. You see the... And I know what you mean. You're yeah, there yeah. You're there to go... It's almost like purgatory. Dude, yes. You know what I mean? Like, that's you're there to go and train to become the most elite operator in in the country yeah and you're learning how to iron fucking clothes bro and, and fold you're my socks. how to fold sheets and the most nervous i've ever been is writing my name on the back of my t-shirt yeah you know what i mean it's like yeah i think that's like the main thing is like you, the whole time you're thinking about this other thing you're looking and for I'm, some and kind i'm getting of motivation. chewed out because my shirt doesn't have the perfect yeah fight. you know what i mean and I know it's like attention to detail stuff, but it it's it was just like a limbo. Yeah, you're you know? looking it's like a means to an end. You're looking for like some something that has anything to do with <laughs> yeah. being an operator, even just not even being an operator, yeah. anything to do with combat and it doesn't it yeah. just doesn't come so you're not getting anything to feed that motivation. The only motivation you have is holy shit, if I quit, this is life. Yeah. And yeah, and I mean, yeah, we, I mean, exactly. And then you know, you do you're doing some kind of workouts with the dive motivators and stuff, but you're kind of getting out of shape. You're not really doing good workouts. You're not really eating good food. Um, <clears throat> and so you know, you go through boot camp, check into buds, and the floodgates open. You know, you all of a sudden you're there grinders right there Look, there's helmets on the grinder you see your first brown shirt it's like dude it's all real you know this isn't just some book or some documentary like this crap's real and then you see the blue and golds the instructor staff and you're like holy shit and uh, I remember doing the my first surf torture with my brothers like at the end of the line and you know they're always like head back head back they want your ears to fill up with sand and water. And I was like, all right, head back. I'm going to do perfect. You know, this is going to be perfect. And I got up, dude, and I thought I was going to throw up all over the place. Like, you get up and you're like stumbling, you know, and you're like, oh. Everybody's like, what the fuck was that? Like, <laughs> I look at my brother and we both look at each other and like, not chill. Like, that was not, like, not what I expected. But coming back, it was, he was always a touch point. You, you know, he's always like that, that continuity for me. And <clears throat> we were, went through in doc together. The instructor staff thought it was funny because my brother's like a foot shorter than me. He's my older brother. Like, Hughes and Hughes. Brothers in a buds class together? What? They let you do this? And we we're like, who ya? You know? <laughs> like, you guys are swim buddies and dive buddies and you're gonna be together all the time. Like we never want to see you guys apart. No shit, they yeah. put you guys together. Put us together, swim buddies. And I'm I'm faster than my brother in the pool. I'm faster than him on runs. But dude, he was like hurting injury wise and 
boot camp and stuff and I was like feeling fresh and then we got to buds and the role switched he was like fresh and my legs are like falling apart and I'm like bro what happened so all of a sudden he's feeling good on these runs and I'm like I might have to take this one a little bit slower bro um, but we were on a swim one day we're swimming the instructor's circling us in his jet seat ski hurry up you're not gonna make the time hurry up and uh I'm like, Josh, hurry, hurry up, man. He's right behind me, he's kinda like on my heels. I'm like, dude, we cannot, I do not want extra buds, right? And I'm freaking, I'm tired. The night before, uh, at the end of the day, you do grinder cleaners, right? Where you sweep all the sand off the grinder, you clean up the instructor's office, uh, you get everything ready for the next day. And two students had been caught walking as they were taking out trash. And so an instructor came out, he saw it, he's like, guess what? Tonight, you're all gonna be writing, I will not walk while at basic underwater demolition school 1,000 times. And so we're jerry-rigging all these pins together, like it, every student has to write this a 1,000 times. Damn. Dude, it was brutal. So by the time I finished writing this, I had five pins together and I was writing it down. I had. It was like five minutes till muster. Close my eyes, wake up, sleep in my uniform, put my boots on, go downstairs, get ready for the swim. So I'm like pooped, bro. I'm like, Josh, I don't want extra bus today. It's week one, Wednesday. I was like, you better, we better not fail. So I'm kicking him, kicking him, kicking. He's kicking, he's kicking. We get past the finish line. I think we're like the f fifth swim pair. Calls out our time, and we're like five minutes under the the time that we needed. And I'm like, nice, you know, like high five and he's like looking at me. He's like, dude, I think I'm done. I'm like, what do you mean? You think you're done? It's like, I think I want to do something else. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's talk about it at lunch. I said, just wait, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. We got a little admin time and then we're gonna, we can talk about it at lunch. And uh, <clears throat> he comes over, he didn't finish his writing assignment the night before. He's like, some instructor on the bullhorn, if you didn't finish your writing assignment last night, report for, you know, report to the goon squad, whatever. And so I'm like, and he's like, goes over, does his little extra buds. I go back, start changing on my wetsuit. And then uh, get to lunch. And I'm like, I'm just sitting down with him. I'm like, all right, dude, like, really think about this. And he's like, listen, man. He's like, this isn't what I've always wanted. He's like, this was kind of a means to an end for me. He's like, I wanted this so that I could do something else when I get out. And he's like, I don't necessarily have to do this to do that. And, and I was like, dude, I, I, get, I get it, dude. This is hard, you know? It's like, I got nothing else. It's like, you go. I'm going to stay for one more evolution. I'll see you later. And so we disappeared. And uh, we go back to the pit. Go upstairs, call my mom and dad. Like, guys, Josh quit. They're like, wow, how are you? You know, like, I'm okay. I think I'm okay. I'm a little bummed. I'm like, hey, hang in there, you're good. And uh, this was like the first time in my whole life that there's no more family, right? My brother was gone, parents couldn't help, it was me. And I had to make a choice, right? All right, I'm gonna do another evolution. Walk downstairs and uh, Three of my good buddies all made it, all who made it. They put their arms around me. They say, don't worry, Hughes. We're your brothers now. And uh, they're like, let's go do another evolution. Yeah. Um, dude, went out, never thought about it. Never thought about quid. I was like, from then on, dude, I was like, this is it. Just, I mean, doesn't matter what happens anymore, I'm all in. Did that affect your guys' relationship? 
That was a good, yeah. I mean, there was definitely, you know, we joke, the instructor staff afterwards is like, <clears throat> going to make an awkward Thanksgiving for the Hughes bros, you know, and like yeah. coking and joking. And it, it didn't, it didn't. Cause, it didn't? No, because my brother was the guy, he's like, you know, yeah, dude, freaking hate the cold. Wasn't for me. And he owns it. He right? owns it? Yeah, totally owns it. And uh, to me, that's one of like the most annoying things. He's like, yeah, you know, my Achilles is hurt, and they told me pretty much that I had to quit because because they weren't going to roll me, so I quit. Are you talking about like, in general? No, I'm talking about in general. A lot of yeah. dudes do that shit. You know, they just like make up reasons for why they quit, and they oh, just yeah, don't you, own it. Like they have you, tons of excuses, right? You never meet an actual buds quitter. You just meet everybody that got med dropped. Dude, yeah, you know. Yeah, and. uh and so he's not that guy. He, I mean, it's a cool conversation that we can have, and yeah, and you know, he kind of reflects back on some of those stories. I mean, it's definitely but respectable. It, we're you super. Know? We're yeah, we're still super cool. I call that guy every single day. And we chat all the time. Good. So, I can see where that um, could definitely get in the way. But he, <coughs> on the other hand, he made it. it. Sounds like he made a very calculated decision, and it wasn't. Yeah. You know, I mean, he didn't. Whatever. Yeah. He didn't quit in the Dude. moment. No, I mean, yeah, to an extent, right? But uh, my brother is definitely one of the dudes. He is undoubtedly one of like the most intellectual people that I know. He's now an army chaplain, and like to me, he's like like levels above like wisdom and knowledge. And information that I could ever attain, you know. So a lot of times in my life, even like this interview, you know, I call up my brother. I'm like, "Hey, man, I don't know what I'm gonna talk about, bro." I was like, "I don't, I don't really know." He's like, "Listen, build like a story, you know." He and he kind of like talks me through it. He's like, "This is, you know, he helps you navigate some of those like intellectual challenges that I really struggle with." Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't. It hasn't really to answer your question. It hasn't. Good. It's been pretty. That's cool. If anything, man. It's, it's kind of, if anything, it's kind of built us because like, we both went our own ways, and it like, we didn't have to like piggyback off each other's careers, and there was no like competitiveness in the team. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, it's just like, dude, you did your thing. I'm doing my thing. He found his calling. Yeah, he found his calling. He wasn't being a seal. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with that. Exactly, man. And uh, so yeah, to go back, um, dude, I remember. Uh, Kind of closing out, the, I guess the buds portion. That was kind of like the highlight, like the hard part for me, of buds. But other than that, it was like injury stuff. I was dealing. I remember my Achilles tendon just was like so swollen, and just getting to the point where I'm like, I'm, I don't know if this can hurt more. I think the next level of pain that I can feel with this is like my foot falls off, my bone's sticking out, right, like. I remember running and chasing freaking Eddie Gallagher, who was one of my instructors. Eddie Gallagher Eddie, was one of your instructors? Yeah, yeah and he is freaking fast, bro. What was he like as an instructor? Um, he was hard. Was he? He was tough. Was he, a, he was a hammer. He was the asshole. Yeah, he was a quiet asshole. Oh, Yeah, he's shit. the asshole that like doesn't have to say very much. He's the night shift. Dude, yeah, Eddie, okay. Eddie is the night shift. Yeah, and, I could uh, see Eddie being. I remember right chasing shift. Eddie, and my ankles like on fire. I'm like, dude, I'm just gonna catch him and I'm gonna stay with him. And I'm like, I don't care what my tendon feels like. I catch up, and I'm like right next to Eddie. I get closer and closer, and then he's just like, kind of looks over, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> he rips off. We we circle back, you know, and he knows I'm just like kind of being a smart ass like just trying to catch up with the instructor staff and he's like deuce get over here he's like can't wait to see you quit like your brother and i'm like who ya <laughs> like i don't know dude <laughs> you know? he's like he's just you know he's getting in my head and uh yeah and and so <clears throat> i ended up having stress fracture like an eight centimeter stress fracture in my left tibia after hell week and I ran it through to second phase, got rolled day one of second phase and 
um, rolled back into a future class and finished out buds. I got a question. Yep. You said three guys after your brother left. Mm -hmm. Three guys came and said, we're your brothers now. Did they make it? All made it. All, All of them made guys. it? Every single one of them. No shit. Yep. That's amazing. How cool is that? That's cool. It was really sick. I actually I got to do a, uh, a driving school. It was like we hadn't seen each other. They all went East Coast, and I was a West Coast guy. And two of them were at it. And it was just, it was like a huge reunion, you know. But I was like, dude, because we hadn't connected in so long. And, uh, y you know, you end up going to different teams, and, and you just kind of drop. Yeah. Like, you look at your old Bud's picture, and you're like, I don't know, dude. I don't know a lot of it. I, I have no clue what these people are doing now. Yeah. It's always cool to reconnect with them, but yeah, all of them made it. I think one of them's out now, and then the other two are still in. So right on. Crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. You got any Hell Week stories before we move on from Buds? Oh, geez, Hell Week stories, man. Gosh dang. Dude, I remember there being like weird stuff that was going on. I remember like, uh, <clears throat> I remember them playing like music that was like for children and just constant baby crying, you know, music. And we went the first day, do, you know how you get the rollback word, mm -hmm. right? You're always looking at the rollbacks like, Wait, what? so what? what's this look like? What's day one look like? And all the rollbacks had told us like, okay, so we're gonna do breakout, we're gonna do log PT, you know, the bass tour or whatever it is. Some nerd's gonna be like, base tours on take three, you know? I don't know. I don't know what the exact schedule is. I'm like, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. I got this. And dude, it was like breakout, log PT, and then we got our boats and ran down like, I think eight miles to the stick. And we spent like the first three days down at the stick away from base, eating MREs. And uh, um, doing the whole spiel. I remember at one point one of the instructors like dumping sand on us day one, you know, where like we had won a race and him looking around and like saying, hey, Hughes, look around in this class. How many people do you think are gonna quit? It's like, I'm like, I don't know, man. Everybody seems pretty solid. And then I'm like, but my brother quit, so I have freaking no idea, you know? Like, I don't know, bro. How many people are gonna make it through this pipeline? But uh, I don't know. Yeah, weird buds, weird, weird head, hell week stories. Hey, well, you don't have. To I don't know. Man. Yeah, I probably think of something and come up with it, but it's all blur to an yeah. extent, right? Like you remember bits and pieces. I remember, dudes. I remember doing what is that one uh, around the world? Mm -hmm. There was this one kid who was always falling asleep, and. And you take your paddle and you're like, hey, dude, wake up, start paddling. We're in second place. We don't want to freaking lose. Second place, they're just like letting us take a break at the end. And somebody sneaks out and like throw a bag of the full size Snickers bars in our boat. We're like, all right, man, listen, if you're not going to paddle, all you have to do is unwrap these Snicker bars and you're going to feed us, right? So I remember like paddling and then just feeling like a Snickers bar, like, like. <laughs> <laughs> Dragon in my mouth, dude, and I ate so many Snickers bars, and I was so pumped because it was like, it tasted good, one meal finally tasted good, and dude, we got to the break, and I was just dying, man, my stomach, I was just like curled over, I was like, too much, you know, like, <laughs> no, like, I'm not eating any more Snickers, dude, my stomach was so messed up, so messed up. And then, it, I mean, did you know how it goes? Like, you're taking dumps in the surf, and you're like, how do I poop in the ocean? You know, I've never done that before. So you, like, pull your pants down, you're trying to, like, take a dump, and the waves in the sand are, like, brushing your, your butt crack. <laughs> and then you're like, I think I went poop, and you look down, there's no turd, it's just, like, sand, and you're like, where is it? Like, <laughs> where is it? I don't want to, like, pull it into my pants. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. You, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, just weird stuff. It's just a weird time, man. Yeah. It's all a blur. Well, moving on. Yeah, sorry. So what team are you going to? So. When you graduate. Uh, yeah. Uh, get on the buds. Go to. I end up getting orders to SEAL Team 5. 
And right before seal, uh, right before checking in, that's when my wife and I got married. My wife, whom I met in Thailand, we kind of talked, and she was going to nursing school. I was looking at doing the seal thing. She was my girlfriend at the time. I was like, I don't want any distractions. You don't need any distractions while you're going to nursing school. I said, let's just, like, let's not talk for a little bit, and maybe we can link up when all this is done, you know? And so I got rolled, kind of started, got a little lonely, started texting her. And so rekindled some stuff, and when I graduated Buds, she was like, oh, I'm going to come out and be a nurse in Southern California. I said, oh, well, how convenient. And so we started dating again when I was an SQT, decided just to get married. Um, so we got married right before I checked in. I think I just finished SEER. Oh, dude, I, I had just finished SEER. So it was like we did the FTX, and I remember the same thing, brown shirt uh, pass down. Like, dude, how long is this FTX? Because it's like right before Christmas break, and that's the only time I can get married. You know, it's like the only leave that you're pretty much, you know, you're going to get when you're in training. And he's like, oh, dude, I think it's like you get, you start it on Monday, you finish it on Wednesday, and then you get like a day or two off. He's like, I'm pretty sure that's it. And, dude, I remember it being Wednesday and watching the sun go down and being in this like little jail sale. Somebody like hosing me down and being like, son of a bitch, dude, my wedding's in two days. And I'm still in this jail cell. <laughs> <laughs> butt oh, naked man. and uh <clears throat> and dude like we secured thursday got on a plane friday got married saturday and i'm have, I have like you know they slap you around and stuff and i have like bruises on my cheek i'm all like skinny and i got a cold because you know you've been out living in hosed off woods it's just like you know malnourished so i get married get orders for SEAL Team 5. And then with all my experience and where I lived, I'm like, hey, I speak this language. You know, I can help here. They're like, you should learn Pashto. I'm like, what the frick is Pashto? You know, they're trying to send all the SEALs to language school. Like, this little sliver in Afghanistan, you want me to learn this language? So went to Pashto school while my platoon was coming back from Afghanistan. And... They had had a really good deployment in Afghanistan, got into a lot of combat, and I was a new guy coming into a platoon with a pretty great reputation. So, you know, you just try to be the good new guy. And so, yeah, that's kind of like where I started out at SEAL Team 5. Hopefully that was comprehensible. Yeah. I know it kind of bounced around a bit. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so <clears throat> checked in, SEAL Team 5, start ULT. I'm a comms guy, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, unit level training. Um, you go into your unit. Everybody kind of gets their jobs. Some guys get specialty training if there's billets that are open up. And our platoon's performing pretty well. And they're like, hey, you guys are going to go to Yemen. And I'm like, oh, that's that's a cool country. Like that, I, there's definitely some bad guys there. I, like, we might actually get to do some work, you know. And you're kind of getting hand down, and you're you're learning about who you're going to be working with. And uh, we were going to be augmenting with our platoon is going to be augmenting with development group and helping with their mission there. And uh, and so you know everybody's fired up to do this deployment. What year is this? 2014, I th- okay. I think, or 2014 to 2015. Um, the way that the rotation worked, it was always like a Christmas and then a Christmas off and then a Christmas off on deployment. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Like so, so we were there between 2014 going into 2015. What part of Yemen? Uh, we were kind of, I don't know if I should All right, say, you don't I don't know if anything. we go into like the details of like exact locations because of the guys that we were working with. Mm-hmm. Um, but primary mission there was vehicle interdiction, VI. And so they're, you know, tracking dudes. And our job was to train and handle the Yemeni's, like, premier counter-terrorist unit. And so <clears throat> this was probably... You always hear the stories 
about expectation management and expectation management you know go into it whatever happens happens if you get to see some action you get to see some action and you get there and you start kind of seeing what the op tempo is like and you're like wow i'm we might not do any good work you know and this is the first time in my career where i realized like, dude there's seals that have never been in combat yeah you know like there's a lot of people who spend their whole careers and maybe get shot at once right or get to shoot their guns once maybe so you're like dude I gotta figure out how I can chase the fight you know you're like I don't, I don't want to miss it you know yeah. this is how long has this war been going on did I miss it yeah and so this is the first time this is all connecting with me and and fortunately it wasn't an uneventful deployment like a couple the way that the rotation for our platoon worked with handling these dudes is they would do there was kind of like a like a lottery like this week two dudes are the handlers and then the next week two other guys are the handlers and if an op pops off and you guys get to go like you two are on the list you're on the you're on whatever chalk and so you know some of the guys were super fortunate and got to do an awesome awesome mission but handlers for Yemeni special forces okay yeah so the way that a lot of these countries like to work it is they like to put the face of their nation on mm -hmm. the operation so you include them in the operation sometimes you do um, the Americans do most of the work mm -hmm. and pretty much just try to make sure that the Yemenis don't shoot themselves or us I didn't so realize kind of that the, that was yeah same yeah. thing with us in Iraq and Afghanistan as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize they were doing that in Yemen. Yeah, that's uh, that was my f first deployment, man. And honestly, like we got rocketed, but you come back and you're like, man, it was a good bonding experience with the guys. I learned a lot from working with the guys that we were working with, but it's kind of disappointing. Like, I'm kind of disappointed that I didn't get to do the work that I joined the military to do, right? And so you try your best because the way that the platoons work and the way that the unit level training cycle works is, you know, whoever's the top performer gets to go to whatever the most d dangerous operation, uh, the most dangerous theater is, right? So I guess the way that trade at works is as you're going through all these training pipeline, like these SEAL training, right? This deployment training, you do, they kind of grade you and there's whispers and talk. I don't, I don't know, man. It's like all over my head, but they, they essentially grade you, your platoons. And you're like, Hey, this platoon needs to go here. This platoon is definitely better at the MARAP stuff. They'll go to PI or something. And then, you know, top form performing platoon like they're going to Syria or Iraq or Yemen yeah, whatever the mission whatever the mission set is um, so I we start out our platoon I get the opportunity to go to JTAC school Joint Terminal Attack Controller for those of you that don't know what that is it's uh, anytime there's aircraft in the air not any time, but most of the time, that there's a soft component on the ground. There's usually a ground somebody on the ground talking to the to the aircraft and coordinating what we're seeing, what the GFC, who's the ground force commander, what his intent and what he wants, and telling them essentially what to bomb, when to bomb, and where to bomb. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I went to the JTAC school, <clears throat> and it's very cookie cutter. It's very book study heavy. You go out to the range. It's sanitary. You got your map out. You got your radio. You know you can see the aircraft. Everything's like very controlled. And essentially, the way it works is you kind of coordinate with them. Make sure you're both looking at the same thing. There's kind of a contract that's ginned up in verbal form and then you give them permission to strike, right, with your GFC's approval, Ground Force Commander's approval. So I did the schoolhouse, man, and did okay. I felt like I did really well, but 
you get to the platoon, and as we all know, like the op tempo in the platoon is completely different than how the schoolhouse does things. And so I remember we start ULT, we start uh, mobility, was my first block where I was practicing as a primary JTAC for our platoon. And dude, I was a shit show. It was a complete disaster. Like, I go in, we go into the sim simulator, and fortunately for me, man, my my platoon chief was a very, very good communicator and had a great reputation for being a good JTAC. We go into the simulator, my first block, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna show them, you know, all the things that I've learned in the schoolhouse, you know, and you start and they're, he's like, oh, mortar's coming in. And the simulator's like a huge dome and you got like your, kind of your compass and your tools that you can use and there's a guy back there pretending like he's the aircraft and you got your radio. So you just walk it all out, right? And you can see, oh, okay, I'm getting mortars and you're And so you start like, okay, I'm gonna get my little map out. I'm like, all right. And then it's like, like somebody's shooting. You see them kind of walking towards you. Like, oh, uh, okay. So maybe we're going to, I'm going to focus on that thing. Right. And it's like somebody else is shooting at you now. And you're like, oh, uh, which one do I focus on? Like, this is way more than I knew how to handle from what I was learning in the schoolhouse. It was always like, so easy. It's like, hey man, I want you to hit this building right here. Just tell them to blow up that. And, and like, that was it. Right. And now like the stress was on. And I remember being done, dude, and I'm like, sweat. And I feel out of breath, and I'm like, that was not chill. And I look back, and the instructor cadre, like the trade deck cadre, was kind of like rubbing his chin, looking at me. My platoon chief was kind of like looking at him. And, uh, and I'm like, I am so sorry. <laughs> I was like, I am so sorry. And, uh, and my platoon chief was like, come on, come here. He's like, don't worry. We're gonna get you up to speed. And Rocky Montage number two, man. I start, like, it is on the mic, eight hours a day, going constantly, every single operation, like every training op we're doing, I'm doing runs. And <clears throat> for, for me, it was one of those things where in this community, I felt pretty comfortable and confident, but it was an extraordinarily humbling experience just to be like so bad at something but to have guys again come in and say like hey man here's how we do things here here's how you work this here's here's the priority here and just to have that support system and such good mentorship um, in my platoon was extremely beneficial and I know a lot of guys don't get that mm -hmm. but I think it's just a testament to how like how our platoon was formed how my leadership was in my platoon and uh, we'd really built a great family that was all about bringing everybody up to speed and making sure like we were as lethal as possible, right? Eliminating the kill chain to as small as it needs to be to get bombs on heads. That's awesome. And so, yeah, man, they brought me up and uh, you know, I remember sitting down and he's like, all right, man, like we're going to Iraq. And our platoon splitting up you know, your mentor, JTEC mentor, he's like one of my older guys. He's like, he's going to be with us and you're going to be alone and afraid, you know? And he's, he said, you ready? I said, yeah. He's like, I know you are. He said, if you have any problems or questions, you come to me. I said, okay. And um, GFC, Chief, it's like the you know like the classic before we deploy these are our expectations like this is this is what it's going to look like for you and they're like we have full confidence in you you know and so dude um we start turning over with seal team one who's currently deployed to northern iraq they're dealing with the isis piece chuck keating gets killed during our turnover and all of a sudden it's like, wow, like seals are dying and we're about to be there. You know, this is, this has become a lot more real. And so, you know, for the first time you, you, you try to, not for the first time, you, you try to manage those expectations and, and train to the highest level, right? 
but at the same time you're so hesitant because you don't want to be disappointed right yeah and it's like how do you pace, how do you pace yourself for that and like how do you do that you, you just shoot for the stars man you just do it do the best you can all the time and that's what the teams demand of you and so the whole platoon was in we were ready to go chomping at the bit and we try to maintain our expectations but it's impossible for them not to be that high when you have an enemy like them yeah so. you know you're going to the shed now yeah we feel we we really feel like we are that's it you want to take a quick can we take a quick break let's do it before we let's go to Iraq and start war stories let's take a break Mosul, ISIS, take us there. <laughs> Foreign countries, it's dangerous. Now, uh, <clears throat> you know, so I'll start from right off the bat, initial impressions. We kind of work through the progression of the op tempo and kind of like how life looked there. Is that cool? So day one, I think. So the way the flights work is the platoon's kind of broken up. And people arrive at different times. You do turnovers with your counterparts that's that are in the platoon that you're relieving. And so being the JTAC with my OIC, we're on the first flight out. We get in the country, you know, check out our house, start meeting some of the guys that we're going to be turning over with. <clears throat> and they say, hey, SAS lives down the road. They want to have a barbecue with you guys. Meet you tonight. So sweet. He's like, I think they just got off like a three day out. And um, I'm like, cool. Yeah, we'll head down. So, you know, we grab our guns, drive down the road, go over to their house. They're like grilling, you know. They got like sweet Land Rovers. And uh, they're all just like kicked back, relaxing. It's like this, the scene that you'd expect, you know. We just start sitting down and talking with them, and they're telling us about their day and their time on the flot, which is the forward line of troops. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, so how'd it go? He's like, oh, mate, it was, uh, it's pretty good to the v bit show up. I said, well, what happens, what happens when the v bit showed up? And he's like, well, he tried to shoot it. I said, okay, and then what? And have you guys had any success like blowing him up? He's like, not really. He's like, I said, so what happens when it gets close? He's like, you fucking run, mate. <laughs> and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, look over at my OIC, and I'm like, we run. Like, <laughs> is that a is that like a back left call or like <laughs> what yeah. does that look like? If I'm not training, bet, run, run away, and uh, and dude, I I remember just being like, okay, this is a little different than what I ex like expected, and the way that the battlefield is set up is more like World War One than a modern warfare scene that you would expect. Seals to be fighting in. Uh, where we were working with the Kurdish forces, who's the Peshmerga, I'll also refer to them as like the Pesh for short. The Pesh had built up a flot, four line of troops, and it was essentially a berm and trenches with outposts <clears throat> all along their territory. And then ISIS had controlled villages that, you know, they killed most of the people or when they moved in, a lot of the people ran away. But essentially these villages were completely deserted. 
Um, maybe a couple other families would stay behind. And they had dug in intricate tunnel systems and built rat lines in and out of these villages. And so when we first came into country, our typical job was to develop, understand, and find and fix, hopefully kill ISIS in these villages. Hmm. So, for instance, you go up to the four line of troops, you ride in, you know, early morning, and you kind of get all your gear set up, get your mortar set up, and then almost every single time you get up there, you start receiving mortar fire. So, um, the best way I can kind of describe what that sounds like to people is you, you get you get used to kind of like knowing what it, what is mortar and what isn't, but you can tell when somebody launches a mortar, it almost doesn't matter how far away because it sounds like a car door slamming. So you hear a car door slam. Um, our SOP was like, you know, you close your car door, you yell car door. So people knew it wasn't an enemy mortar. So you get up to the flat, set up your mortar, um, launch a Puma, which is like a um, our own ISR, little ISR platform with a short battery life. What and is ISR? Can you what's describe up? that? Can you describe um, ISR? I, essentially, it's just a, it's a platform. Some of them are armed, some are not, but it's a platform with a camera. Some of them have um, FLIR, which is white hot, red hot. It's a drone. Um, yeah, it's a, li- it's a tiny little cardboard drone. Uh, ISIS would call it the cardboard airplane. So whenever they called it out on comms, they'd be like, they sent the cardboard airplane. And so we'd throw out our little drone and start scanning these villages and just developing a pattern of life. And it got to the point where you start to recognize people. You start to notice when vehicles come and go. You start to notice what buildings they go into. And if you're lucky, you start, you get right up to the flot, you start getting mortared, you identify a poo site, hopefully you can get aircraft on station, we can call in a strike, it's a good day. Or you identify the poo site, it's impossible to get aircraft because they're located somewhere else. And your boys set up their mortars and you just start like this mortar battle or lob 50 cal rounds at them and try and hit them. But a big struggle is locating an enemy poo site, like mortar poo site. For those, sorry, I didn't go into what a poo site is. It's just a point of origin. And I can get you some, I have some pretty good footage of what that looks like. If you want to run it, you can uh, Absolutely. You can show, and then I can show like a sh- strike on a poo site. It's pretty cool. Absolutely. So we'll what, get you some of that stuff too. Before we go into the those, the poo site, mm-hmm. the flot, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, is it like a line of, of, <clears throat> coalition forces no so uh it's all pretty much manned by peshmerga forces okay and then coalition forces would deploy to different parts and just support different elements of the flot so you're always receiving intel like oh this section of the flot might be you know they might push this section of the flot and so we'd go and reinforce that section of the flot and be ready so it's a moving then, line uh, it's not. It's it's pretty built up. Like I mean, they have, like they have some nice structures, but there are berms like bulldozers pushed in, sandbags built up. It's very like fortified, and it's oh, held shit. up. And and essentially, we're just kind of waiting. How long? It's, how it's long mold. is it? Mile, miles and miles like around through? the city of Mos. Like okay. Like hundred like hundreds of miles. Okay. Dude, it's like all the way around Mosul. Wow. And Mosul is still you know, 50 miles away from where our position is. So it's a good distance. Like you can't even see the city from where we are. So you go up to it and you know, the Pesh are super friendly. They're a great fighting force, a good partner force, very motivated, and they love to kill ISIS. So we loved working with them, building a relationship. You know, they, they have like their tea time, chai, 
and uh, we do the little key leader and get KLEs with their leadership, regular chai meetings, but um, our, they fought really well with Chuck Keating and his platoon, built great relationships that turned over to our platoon. And we just kind of nourished that and built really good camaraderie. So anytime we showed up, everybody was excited. And uh, they had some good intel for us, like, hey, this building right here, that one right there, there's bad guys in it. It's like, all right, cool. We're going to go check it out. We're like, hey, we've been seeing, they'd always pay, give us a pretty good pass down on, on the local area. And so you're building up this pattern of life on these villages. You're taking notes bring it back and and you're typing in you know like what time somebody left what time somebody went in and hoping that you see a gun you know and essentially if you saw that gun or they tried shooting at our drone like you were gonna you were gonna kill them and and a lot of times you get creative right you're like oh we're gonna get it like there's a guy, I bet he looks like he's up to no good, you know, and you get close, cl- like closer to him, you try to get him low. He rips off his backpack, starts dumping rounds. You're like, gotcha. All right, bring it back. I'm calling in a aircraft and we'll get eyes on him and hopefully and drop. And because the forward line of troops was so long, man, these aircraft were like all over the place. You're dealing with French Raphaels, you're dealing with like every gas platform under the sun essentially but there's only so much to go around so sometimes if if almost if you were lucky you'd get a cast platform um but some strikes took like two or three hours to develop just to get aircraft to to drop on some of these guys and so there's there's frustrations in that you know in and of itself just like it's not necessarily what you thought you were going to be doing Um, you still feel like you're contributing to the fight, right? But you're like, ah, I'm kind of getting restless. Like this is kind of monotonous. I'm kind of getting used to getting mortared. I'm ready to do something a little different. And so there's like a little tick, I think. Everybody felt it. Like, all right, we're ready to do some more Navy SEAL stuff and not just shooting people, shooting people with 50 cows and dropping mortars and watching Kill TV and dropping bombs on people yeah you know? and I think part of that was like I feel really fortunate because I was a JTAC and I was constantly I was constantly working even when we came back they'd be they'd say hey you have 16 hours of watch on this ISR platform I'm like damn dude I just got up to like two days off the flot <sighs> okay like I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here and watch the screen I'm talking to on the phone to um, this ISR platform and we're developing pattern of life on this village together. And so <clears throat> it got to the point where I put like new guys or other dudes were like, hey, I'll, I'll take a shift and, and watch. I'm like, all right, you know, you train them like, this is what we're looking for. If anybody asks this, this is how you respond. I said, if you see anybody with a gun, come get me, you know, or doing something nefarious. And that could be transporting ammunition, moving a V-bid, um, find like digging a cave in cave the cave system was insane so just come get me so you know i'd be asleep and then be like woody there's a guy with a gun all right you know go over type hey you know you guys got in here yeah we can get a we can get you hellfire all right right do the little contract bring a couple guys in they're like boom watch them fly up in the air 70, 80 feet. Like, hey man, let me know if there's anything else. I'm, gonna, I'm going back to bed, you know. And that yeah. was kind of like it for. Like we got there in August, August through September. Okay. And in, in beginning of October. So about two so months. Was, yeah, about two months. And and honestly, it was really nice. Like having, it wasn't. I wouldn't say it was like fast pace. Um. We were always gone, like we were always going to the flot every day, every other day, maybe one, two days, sometimes three days, if there was something really going on or something, some kind of collection that we needed. But it was, it was pretty constant and 
it was just enough action to like keep us on our toes but also sometimes n not enough the mortars were just inaccurate enough so you're kind of like get you get a little bit complacent you're like uh, another mortar yeah you know and, and we talked about it a little bit like um del del we got to work with some delta guys and those dudes were doing their mission, but they couldn't really do anything because of the nature of the flot and what ISIS had posted up. All the roads are V-bitted, are um, IED'd, and ISIS had like anti-aircraft stuff, uh, capabilities. So, um, you know, our budget was kind of smaller. We'd have to conserve our Javelin rocket system, which is essentially an anti-tank rocket. It launches up in the air locks on to a heat signature of some sort, drops down and, and blows up whatever you're trying to, to shoot. So we have, you know, we have a limited number of javelins. We have to kind of like work, like s s conserve our mortars, right? We don't have a huge budget. And these guys are like, hey man, we got like 70 javelins and we just, we just want to go out and do some good work. We're like, let's go, you know? And so they land on their Chinooks. We'd pick them up, offload a ton of javelins. We'd go to the flat, destroy anything with a heat signature. Essentially, that was doing something bad. And uh, head back, re-outfit. They'd hit us up on the phone. Hey, man, got some rangers over here that need some mortar experience. Bring them out. Bring out 100 mortars, whatever. Get in a little mortar battle. And then, and then head back. No shit. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> you know, the whole time, we all know, like, Mosul is right there. Yeah. And so we're all chomping at the bit to, like, we want to do more. Like, this isn't, this isn't enough. Like, let, let's go. Let's you want to get up close Yeah, you want to get close. All right. Yeah. And you hear rumors, you know, hey, it might happen. It might happen. And then it's like, Hey, it's probably gonna happen. You're like, if it happens, like, are we gonna get the third A? You know, the advise, assist, and accompany. We were afraid it was just gonna be the advise and assist, right? right? Where we're like, oh, we're gonna tell the generals what to do, and then we'll hang out at our house, and you can come to us with any questions, and we'll kind of keep doing our job from from afar. So we were kind of nervous, like, dude, if this really goes, like, can we get the a company like we want to be there we want to be with them and dude overnight comes out we're going to Mosul it's like and it's happening in like two days maybe 24 hours and so it's like whew. hey guess what we got the third day like fuck like we're gonna like we're gonna lead an invasion, dude. You know, we're gonna be part of like taking the city, <clears throat> and it's cool. Um, I mean, everybody hears about what ISIS is doing, and and the crap that they're doing to women and children. Anybody that doesn't believe in them, and it it kind of took me back to, you know, let's just, let's, let's let's refresh everybody's yeah, yeah. memory. Yep. What are they doing? Um, they are going into pretty much every village. Anybody who isn't, it doesn't conscribe with their religious beliefs. Either taking women and children as slaves, publicly assassinating their men. Um, How? I'm, oh, dude, they're just lining them up and taking them out to the river and just popping them, dropping them in rivers. Pop them, drop them in river. Pop, like cattle. And slaughter, like slaughtering people public executions, beheadings, I mean, you name it, dude, these, it's as, they're as bad as they get. Burning people alive. Drowning them In alive. cages. Yep, wrapping deck cord around their heads. Deck and cord de is basically a rope that is an explosive, Yep. for those uh, that don't know. Lining up Christians on the beach, wrapping deck cord around their heads, clacking it off, I mean, and, and putting this on, on the internet. You know, and so, you know, as a young kid, he was growing up in the church, 
<clears throat> you think back to my ch- I think back to like my high school and dealing with the struggles of like why aren't all of Americans on a team and why don't we all unify and wh- how come we can't get along and I moved to this foreign country and I'm like dude well, like what what does it mean to be an American and and what makes what makes us, what makes us like value, like why do we fight for the things that we fight for? Like, right? And, and like you gotta come to turn, like at the end of the day, you have to realize that life is precious, right? And it doesn't matter if you're wearing a flag on your shoulder and it's red, white, and blue or red, white, and black or whatever, the, whatever it is right? Life is precious. And those people in that city were suffering. They were being persecuted because of stuff that they believed in. And, and I think that's something that makes, that makes our country so wonderful, right? Is that people are willing to go. And like that I was willing to go. And and my friends were willing to go to risk their lives for, for people that they didn't know, you know? And, and dude, I, even, the, even the Peshmerga, you know? Like, they had tribal territory that they considered theirs, the Kurdish people. Um, the, like, they were gonna go clear these villages that, of areas that they had n- no relation to, you know? Just because it was their country. And they, they were sick and tired of freaking what ISIS was doing, you know. They were motivated. And so, you know, you, you start getting hyped up and you're so freaking stoked to just like, in honor, you feel honored. Like, dude, I am, this isn't news. This isn't CNN. I'm not watching this on Fox News. Like, tomorrow morning, I'm going to line up. We're all going to go to the flot together. We're gonna, there's gonna be a bulldozer. It's gonna knock down that wall, and we're going in. We're going into the city. So you wake up early morning. Our platoon, who was separated, um, split in half, right, to cover this flot. We got together. We get a mission brief. EOD comes up. Talks about the IED threat, VPID threat, very high. Um, and like, hey, uh, first thing in the morning tomorrow, we're going out. Or the, our mission brief was that morning. Said it's pretty much as soon as sun up comes. This is still nighttime, early morning. It's like pretty much as sun up, we're push like the Pesh are gonna break the line, and and we're rolling in with them. So it's a daytime op. What was the actual mission? Uh, so at first, it was to essentially encompass and clear a lot of these villages that were outside of Mosul. Okay. And <clears throat> because of the the sensitivity and time, right? As soon as you break that line and they know you're coming, they're going to start like fortifying. Right, so you don't have a whole lot of time to clear all these villages. So what ended up happening was, is you kind of cordon them off and then deal with them as you can, but we're pushing as quickly as we can to get to the city. And that kind of causes some problems later, and we can go into that um, as far as like enemy tactics and ambushes and, and yeah. that kind of stuff. So day one op. Uh, day one of the invasion, our my half of the platoon is going to start from the north side. The other half is going to break down on the east side. We're going to push. We're going to kind of cordon off this section of villages. We're going to create a, a essentially encompass this section of villages, and then meet up, and then go and push into the city. And then the Pesh are going to like kind of clear out a lot of the villages. And Man, we get it to the flat, and I'm telling you, it is crazy. 
there are thousands of fighters lined up on this berm. It's it's like World War One, man. Just like thousands, as far as you can see. Everybody's gun carrying. There's families there. Mothers and sons were gonna, you know, guys would go out and fight. They'd come back. They eat with their families. Go back out and fight. It, no it was shit. wild, bro. It was Damn. wild. Like parents were running food, you know, out to their their sons who were fighting. Uh, it wow. was it was something else, man. So we line up. We're getting ready. You see, like these nineteen year old kids loading up in these Mad Max armored. Uh, bulldozers and they just look mean man those are some like the toughest people that we see dude they're just like the first ones in you know taking a ton of ton of bullets and mortars and RPGs and they open the door it's like they're sweating like somebody's handing them water and it's like an 18 year old kid driving this thing you know it's crazy but uh so anyway so ISIS is literally (laughs) just like right on the other side of the the berm yeah yeah, just open all these buildings, they have tunnels. Dude, their rat lines are so long and they run so deep. Like they have tunnels that go out like out of the city, out of these like little towns and stuff. So I think um, a lot of them, when they smelt what was in the air, a lot of them cleared out. So maybe you'd find like two, three fighters in these villages. More or less, it was like a lot to harass. But there was definitely a couple of these villages that had like pretty solid fighting position set up and uh and people ready with v bids so we're we're lined up we're ready to go and you hear people start chatting and yelling and everybody's looking up to the sky and we look up and it's a little drone flying around up top and some guy's like, ISIS. It's like, oh man, ISIS knows we're coming. Like, cause they had drones too. They were flying. We're like, it's go time. Like, and then dude, everybody starts shooting at it. The entire like, you what a sound, bro! Like thousands of rifles shooting at a little tiny little <laughs> drone in the sky, bro. It was insane. Everybody's like, what? You know, thousands of guns going off. Just tracers. Going. And you're watching this little drone. And then you see smoke. Spark. And then it's driving. And everybody's just like. It's like a football stadium. You know, we're all like. Yeah. You know. Oh, man. <laughs> it's like some Braveheart yeah, shit. Yeah, it was, it was insane. And then you look back. <laughs> and way in the back. This can't off our Canadian friends. And they're like throwing their hats on the ground, throwing their hands up in the air. It was a Canadian drone. And <laughs> it's like, bro, fratricide on day one. You know, like not a good start. Like, Should have deconflicted. Oh, oh shit. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, a, I was not expecting Yeah, that. I know. Oh shit! Right hook. Good one. Um, yeah, dude. Oh my gosh. Uh, those dudes were crafty, man. With the, the the drone stuff. Even when we were at the flat, yeah, I would like set up a hammock, you know, between our armored vehicles sometimes, and like I'm gonna take. We don't. There's nothing happening. I'm gonna take a little nap. And then the next day at that same spot, drone crashes, lands, and the French are at that at that post. Two patch guys bring it over, like, look at this drone we got. They crack it open, take some pictures, and it detonates. One of the French dudes lose a leg. One of them had like shrapnel to his to his arm. And uh <clears throat> they had rewired and repackaged explosives as like batteries on on the drone. So the Pesh thought, you know, ISIS crashed their drone that they were trying to spy on us with, and it turned out to be booby trapped. You know? Damn. And and we were dealing with uh, the IED thing even on the friendly side. Um, we can go. I have an interesting story about that one too. If yeah. Going to it. Let's hey, go we're gonna, it. Is it okay? We go back back and 
go back in time a little bit before the invasion. Yeah. Um, so it was actually, we were doing the flat route. You know, we were driving out to the flat route, and there's really only one road that we could take to this one OP, this outpost. And vehicles, supply vehicles, kept getting IED'd on that route. And there was a couple instances where they had suicide side bombers that they killed on that route in our EOD. And us, we'd go up, we'd disarm the vests, and then they'd get rid of the bodies. But So they had one route that was specifically getting hit by IEDs a lot. And we're like, all right, well, this is our route. You know, like we take this all the time. Like, let's see if we can find out who's doing this. You know, and there's this little tiny village right off the route. It's the only village in the area that runs right up against this road that we take. So we're like, whoever it is, they're in this village, right? So we're thinking, all right, what if before light, we send up a recce element, they'll post up, we'll see if we can find out where they're, if they're reporting our movements. Right, and maybe we can get. A, maybe we can find out, based off their location, a ping or whatever, um, where they're at, and we can find them. So send out the recce, they get set up, and my job was I was gonna get out of my v. Ve- I was driving up on the road. We were supposed to stop in the middle of the road. I was gonna get out, mess around with some stuff in the back, and see if like, hey. You know, the Americans have stopped on the road because you wouldn't really stop on, on there for any normal reason. So, you know, we assume something, we did something, something's broken in the back or something. So we get out, I'm messing, I mess around with stuff in the back, load up, see what we get when we get back to the flat, continue our mission, whatever. So they get set, Real, this is real time now. We pull up, my new guy, um, D is driving, and I have a EOD guy in the back. I'm like, all right, man, this should be a good spot. It's like, you can just stop here. So he kind of like pulls over to the side of the road, doesn't pull off the road, stops. I'm like, all right, here we go. Open my door, there's maybe a foot between the dirt and the paved road. Jump down, walk around the vehicle, climb up the tire. This is me facing, walk up the vehicle on the village side. I'm in the back, my LPO's in the back. He's uh, in the vehicle behind me, mess around for a minute. He's like, all right, man, should be good. Okay, I hop down, walk around to the front of the vehicle. It was early morning, beautiful sunrise coming up, and I just heard something like on the back of my head say, stop, look around. You know, just like that moment where it's like, just pause. And I stop, I freeze. And I'm like, looking. And dude, from my feet to your feet, I see right off the paved road a little ball of wires and a battery pack sitting right above the ground, covered in dust. And I'm like, that's a fucking IED right in front of our vehicle. I look down the road. Safe in, safe out, right? And I walk to the back of my vehicle, or to my door, climb up, and Dan, who will probably bleep out his name, but he says, what is it, Woody? I say, there's an ID right in front of our vehicle, man. His face like, oh, suck. You know, stay right there. You know, I I get in the vehicle. He clears, he clears around. Turns out, he's like, Woody, you almost died today, man. He's like, there's crush wire all the way against the side of the road where you got out. And so I kept like this little strip of wire where, dude, I mean, if I would have stepped off and stepped on this wire, like that ID was like right there in front of our vehicle. If if we pulled off the side of the road, it would have clacked off, you know? And so, you know, now all of a sudden, we're like, all right, we actually have to fix this because if somebody drives through and this thing goes off, like, you know, somebody's going to die. So we cordon off the road. EOD clears behind us. 
the other vehicle breaks down, comes down towards us, you know, we just stop any kind of traffic. UD comes up, clips it, we attach it to a, a pool line, pull it back with the vehicle, EOD goes to clear the hole, brushes his hand over it, and there's like a secondary switch that didn't go off with a secondary charge under it, man. Talk about a miracle, Shit. right? He's right on top of it, like touches it. And uh, another ID had to deal with that one, and and so yeah, that I mean, like that's the kind of stuff that like y- y- you go to the flat and you're still dealing with stuff, but like there's still you know there's still some danger there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, sorry, we digress from the uh, Mosul thing. I thought I just thought that was a kind of a cool story. Yeah. It's like the near death thing, but um, so should we go back to continue? Yeah. To Mosul. So we go into, we break past the front line, right? That's where we're at. Shot the drone down, killed the Canadian drone. Now we're ready to charge in to finish this off. So we go in, bulldozer busts the line, and we're like vehicle number five in line on the start of this on the start of this train of vehicles. There's like hundreds of vehicles behind us. And immediately, dude, mortar, small arms fire. And it's like, that vehicle, or that building over there, it's like, dumping on it. It's that building over there, dumping on it. It's taking fire from, dude, confusing as fuck. It's, it's the everywhere. best way, like, dude, I, I, there's no way to describe it. Like, it's just, there's so much. There's so many places. And like you cannot you cannot point them all out. And I remember it being so frustrating because like dude, it was just everywhere. It's like, dude, where I mean, where aren't we getting shot from? You Damn. know? And <clears throat> dude, we start driving, we get close to this village where we're supposed to, you know, get around to, and all the vehicles stop. Like, why are we stopped? Why are we stopped? What's going on? Hey, Terp, go run over to the general's car and ask him why to stop. He gets out, goes over to the general car, and he's like, uh, we are doing tea time. <laughs> we're like, no, we're not. <laughs> like, we're not doing tea time. Uh, he's like, we're doing tea time. And I'm like, all right, let's grab a MRE. We're doing tea time. You know, nobody's going anywhere. And uh, dude, like we stopped, we're eating MREs in our Mat V's, and you're seeing dudes kind of like running around their vehicles. I'm like eating my mac and cheese or whatever, and I see like, you know, in the front of our vehicle, 25 yards in front of us, there's guy, guys eating, something slams in the ground. I'm like, RPG. And these dudes like look over, go back to drinking their chai, man. And it's just like. Are you fucking serious? Dude, it was, it was insane. It was absolute madness. Fucking tea time, dude. Tea Holy time, shit. Man. Gotta have your chai. <laughs> They're shooting RPGs at you, dude. I'm not joking. It, this RPG probably landed like 20, 15 to twenty feet from where they, they're like huddled up, and it's literally like a maybe scoot towards the tire a little bit. And then sip in their team, man. Then chill out, right? So, yeah. Wow. So out of nowhere, uh, General and a couple other vehicle start like peeling off. One of our vehicles follows them. And the way that this village is located, there's like a main road that cuts. There's a village, and then there's this kind of like large hill behind them. And that's where the forward line of troops was. Like it kind of curved. Right, kind of curved around. Forward line of troops was there, and they were going to kind of overwatch as we were pushing around this village. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that kind of draw a picture? So the general started going towards this main road that led towards this village. One of our vehicles followed it. They got up a little ways with maybe 10 or 20 other vehicles. And the, I think it's French. Intel were on the hilltop. 
and they said they called my OIC. He's like, hey, there's a V bid moving towards the convoy that's currently just on the road to the village. And my OIC's like, hey, like, you know, I don't know what the general's doing. He's kind of like doing his own thing right now. Like, hey, bring it back, reconsolidate, and we're all going to push in together, you know? And our vehicle is like, all right, check. They whip around, a couple other vehicles follow them, and my vehicle is the frontmost element covering down on the section when they, like, ready to receive them when they come in. Does that make sense? So our guns yeah. pointed towards the village where the supposed V bid was coming to. And uh, we knew that there was some, like, it kind of put us in a weird position because we knew there were some friendly vehicles still that might still come back, right? We don't know how many the general took exactly. So we're like, all right, our vehicle came back, turned around, right, kind of like right next to us. And I'm looking down at my little tablet and I'm like checking out the, the layout and I'm trying to figure out with the road that the French are saying that this V bid's coming from. I'm looking down and uh, my new guy's like, car on the road, car on the road. And I like to click up, 800 yards. What is that pet? Is that a pet? Is that a car? Do we have cars? 700 yards. I start seeing smoke behind the car billowing out. 500 yards. I'm like, dude, I think that's a that's the V bit. And you can see it, man. And it looks like something from Mad Max. It's all, it's just like this Sudan that's plated up. It's got a small window, uh, armored window, maybe two feet by one foot, and it is just freaking plowing right towards my vehicle and uh, our other vehicle here. 400 yards. Tim lighted up. All, every, all our vehicles, and I'm seeing around skip and hitting it. I'm seeing around pinging off the roof of it. I see around hit the glass, shatter it this vehicle 200 yards and I think back to that meeting with the SAS dudes fucking run mate right and as soon as I thought that I hear break contact on comms immediately followed by back right we turn our vehicles around dude gunner's still shooting as we're turning there's two um, light skin vehicles one's a medic truck uh, right behind us we're driving away from it I see the vehicle V-Bit 100 yards 75 and there's there's people all over the ground like there's people running away from this thing and then 50 yards maybe inside clacks off because I order and I I see eight people just he vaporized man missed it gone nothing see a hand fly over the front of our vehicles you know and I remember like thinking whew we're okay and I was like and then you look around and you hear one up, two up, three up, four up. It's like, we're taking the hill. So, we're, it's, you know, follow Vic 4, we're going to take this hill. We pull up to this hilltop. And what are all the Peshmerga doing? What's everybody doing? They're all running away. Like, everybody is running back to the flock. And uh, tanks peeling off out of there. And we're like, we're going to hold the hill. And so we post up. We get a little bit of cover. There's another one right here behind me. There's another one behind us. I'm like, how close? How close? Like, where is it? And then Gunner's like, I got it. I see it. And then you hear our, our guns, all four vehicles going off. And he's like, 
you know, I hear the gunner in in, in the turret. He's like, it it looks like it's trying to like it looks like it's trying to get covered behind a berm. <clears throat> he's like, he might he might be stuck. And then poof, number two goes off. And when that happened, you know, you see people out in the field that were running away, like look back. They saw us shooting. They're like, all right. And they all came charging back. Bulldozer comes back, starts putting up berms, man. And uh, dudes start like digging in. And uh, we we dismount. We're kind of getting the lay of the land. Uh, snipers located right on the side of our map be kind of hunched down looking looking at the village. Another vehicle comes ripping out, man. Holy Same road. shit. Dude. I mean, these guys were armed to the teeth, blowing themselves up to kill us. How how crazy is that? Right? Like, do you ever think, like, how many of us are convicted enough to do something and literally kill yourself to kill somebody else? Do you ever think about how freaking much dedication that takes? I think about it. I used to think about it all the time, and it's it just shows you how dedicated that yeah enemy is. Way more dedicated. Yes. I mean. Absolutely. And they, you know, we'd, we'd go into their caves and you'd find antipsychotic medication, man. Like these guys had been in these caves so long that they were taking antipsychosis meds, right? Because they'd been living in a cave in the dark. It's like, do you know somebody? Are you dedicated enough to do something so much that you're willing to go crazy for it? You know, wow, that's that's an enemy. You know, that's that's something you need to be careful of when you go to fight them. So yeah, man, comes around back of the line, um, clacks himself off on. It was. It, I think it ended up being a father and his two sons. You know, in a in a vehicle, kind of coming out to the flot. Or where we were, wherever we were. So that's three. Another one came from behind. Luckily, the Pesh got him. And I think in, in total that night, we had like five V-bids coming down on our position. And that was just a start. And so, <clears throat> no air. No air assets at the time. They were locked up with a tick. And <clears throat> it was starting to get very dark. My OEC calls me over. So I came in, having trouble with SATCOM. Comms guy's trying to work it too. He's like, I just heard a nine line come out. I said, okay. And he gave me, he's like, they read off, you know, they'll, they'll, sometimes, depending on the SOP, some, some people like doing it, some don't, but uh, it doesn't really matter. They read off his last initial and his last three. And you know, you, you hear the F and you're thinking, how many, like, okay, it could be him, could be him, could be him. Like, who was, it? like, well, okay, the nine line, what, what's the word? And he's like, expectant. And for the viewers that don't know what happens when somebody's called in expectant, it means essentially you're not expecting them to survive. That's my platoon. And uh, so like we're gonna hang out here the night. We're gonna hold. We're gonna hold this spot all night, and then uh, and we'll, we'll we need more ammo. We need yeah. We need more water. Like we'll we'll ride back. We'll refit, and then we'll come back out. And so stayed up all night long. Um, you know, pucker level five thousand. Alone and afraid, <laughs> and uh, sun sun started coming up. Driving back, man, you're driving down the road, and you're kind of like looking out the window, thinking, "What just ha Like, what happened? You know, you're kind of like, "We're not back yet," but what? That that was not what I expected. Like, I felt like it would be a lot more organized than that. You expect it to be, but dude, the enemy has a say. The enemy always has a say. And so 
driving by. <clears throat> there's these nice, like planted fields. And I look, I'm looking down and I see like there's this like little ring around all these plants and I see like one five five around around a bush. I'm like, hey, stop. You know, hey, let, you know, do you know that there's a huge IED here? So you let, alert the partner force. All right, keep driving. So we get back to the house. And you're like, hey, are you JJ Finan's dead. And you know, I I wasn't close. I I won't lie and say I'm I was like best friends with the guy. Uh, he was in our platoon during ULT. He was an excellent EOD. In fact, he was a lot of. I think a lot of guys like try to train you and coach you, but JJ was the guy that was like, "You're not taking this seriously enough. Like this shit will kill you. You know. Like you need to check doors before you enter them. And and I remember that sticking like, dude. JJ's serious, you know, JJ's good. He, he means business. And his story and what happened with the rest of my platoon, I don't feel his mind to tell. But what I can say is that two of my very, very good friends in the SEAL teams and two guys that I like, I love very much would tell you that JJ saved your life that day. Yeah. And so we're day one, one KIA. It's kind of a shit show. <laughs> and and we're going out the next day. You know? So it's like, all right, we're going out the next day. And uh, they were gonna clear that village that we were talking about that we were initially pushing into and we were going to be up on that hilltop as the overwatch element and calling out movement enemy movement to the patches they cleared and you know hopefully giving our snipers some some business i don't know if it was just kind of like hey we need you guys but we don't want to just like throw you back down there right away but like we were going back out there tomorrow yeah so we re re-outfitted went out um, one of our guys got a, a javelin kill, blew up a V bid, and that was like a huge win. Um, just seeing that, and um, the push continues. Was it all IEDs? Do, uh, so so much IEDs and V bids, like so much IEDs and V bids, and a lot of small arm fire. It was, I mean you. You know how it's not always up close. Yeah. It, it most of it, pretty much all of it was just like, you know, muzzle flashes. Or it's the it's the only building there. That's that's the only building, and we're getting shot from that direction. It's oh, coming yeah. from that. You know what I mean? And then you just dump slap rounds into it until the shooting stops. And the shooting stops, and you keep driving. And then you know you put you let the pass run in. That's kind of how that first day went. Shit. We talked about kind of cordoning off these villages. We talked about the push into the city. Well, I think it was around the geez, November, November or December time frame when we're actually like into the city. And <clears throat> as we're pushing up, As we're pushing up, essentially what we're doing is we are located right behind. Anytime, like, the Kurdish, or when we got to the city, the Kurdish pulled back. They are like, hey, we have the land that, you know, is our an an ancestral right, and we don't feel like we need to push into Mosul. And then, um, 
Iraqi forces kind of took over and, and started the initial clearance from the south and east and and kind of held off at the north a little bit. And so our platoon was kind of stopped at, at the northern section of the of the city. So getting into into that, um, I mean, I, I can just give you kind of like what I get, I'll just give you kind of like what how crazy some of these situations were were. I don't know if I can describe every day because every day was different, mm-hmm. right? You'd go some days it it was pretty chill, and there wouldn't be a lot happening. Every day you're getting mortared, right? But I I remember like Christmas. We're kind of holding back. We're doing some ISR. The line's kind of at a standstill, so we're trying to figure out where the enemy is and like what buildings they're holding up. And it's like Christmas Eve or something, and we're doing shifts and rotations, and and you do security on like a guy will do security on the roof, or a couple dudes will do security on the roof. A couple dudes sleeping down, and we're just moving from house to house to house as the flot as the flot gets closer and closer. And you spend one night in one place, and it's freezing cold. So you're going through these <laughs> these people's stuff, and you're like, "What burns?" You know, you're building like small fires to try to keep warm. And then you're packing up, going to the next house the next morning. You're pushing up, and I remember, dude, it would be like you'd be sleeping, and <laughs> and the house rattles, wood board from the ceiling falls, hits your buddy. You like look up. You're like, Dang, you all right? <laughs> yeah. And then you like crash again, you know? And I mean, it was just like constant barrage of of mortars. How and, many guys per so, house? Um, that we were staying in? Yeah. Uh, it got to the point where our platoon would kind of post up. We'd try to find a spot that had like a pretty large courtyard. And uh-huh. we'd just kind of maybe pick two houses. But we were there so temporarily that a lot of times it was like, we're gonna hold up in this house. We might be there for five, six hours, or we might be there for a day or two. It just depended on if we could find a way to maneuver around the enemy and, and push the enemy um, back. So maybe eight per house? Yeah, okay. I would say eight, eight, nine. We had a lot of support. You know, we had CCT guys, CCT, CTT, CCT? Yeah, CCT. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. CCT guys, we had EOD guys. Um, we'd bring the techs out sometimes with us. Um, we had a ton of, I mean, as you can imagine, comms issues. Yeah. And a lot of stuff that we were running, we'd even bring out, you know, satellite dishes so we could do chat with the SODIF. And those dudes would kind of like pop that stuff up. It just depended on what 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 was happening in that region, in that side of the, of the fight, um, how long we would stay. Hmm. Um, but I do remember uh, one night going back to the problem that it creates clearing these houses or these villages at a later time we were in nor- northern Mosul and it was probably 2, 3 in the morning and then an eruption a fire starts Guys start moving up to the roofs. We're starting to move around, and then louder. The volley comes up more and more and more. Mortars start coming in. Tracer rounds are just like whipping and hitting like poles, bricks in front of us. Like dudes are just, you know, getting getting low. <clears throat> and dude, it was like that night was a barrage of gunfire. Gunfire for like three hours. We have guys down below. We're like tossing up our little drone, trying to figure out what's going on. We have some the the ISIS or uh, the Iraqi force in a house just in front of us, and you know they're reporting to stuff to us what they're seeing. And there's like a bulldozer that's pushed up on the on the flat. They had put a bulldozer. Or we had built up a berm around kind of like the section of houses that we were at. There's a bulldozer trying to push in. So we're dumping mortars on this thing. We're, we're watching to see if we can, can get positive hits. We get a hit with our mortar. Dude runs out of it. And um, there's a lull. 
and then all of a sudden, from the south, it was a coordinated attack from ISIS forces to the north and the south. And uh, I remember being on the rooftop, and I'm kind of reporting down to my OIC, who's, who's down below talking to, working, you know, essentially with the soda and telling them, the situation that we're dealing with. We're trying to get air assets. And I remember going down there and being like, yo, you know, M, you want to come up and have some fun with us, dude? And he's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll be up in a second. I Balls deep in this, you know, chat thing. I was like, all right, man, come on up when you're ready. And there's like 10-minute break. A fire, and I'm looking at my APAS. It's still pretty dark. APAS is like a little tablet. I'm like kind of like zooming in on the buildings, kind of like, all right, over there, there. And then M comes over and he's like, Habibi, tell me what's going on over here, man. I'm like, all right, check it out. He's looking over my shoulder. I'm like, so the bulldozer's right here. It's like, this is, that's where we're taking. And I hear, and Mike. He says, fuck, falls down on the ground. I feel something just Charlie horse my collarbone. And I just like drop, I like fumble my tablet. And I'm like, what was that? And I'm like, we're hit, like we're hit. Guys immediately grab Mike and I'm, I don't know what getting shot feels like, you know? Something just slammed me, like am I in shock? And I'm like feeling. What was that? And dude calls back. It's like, what are you okay? It's like, I think I think I'm okay. I think I'm all right. And uh, M had taken around right through the lip, knocked out a bunch of his teeth, and they couldn't find the bullet. So they didn't know if it was log- lodged in his throat. He was conscious. Um, <clears throat> But we didn't know like what the extent of the the in like the damage was in his mouth, so we're like, all right, we gotta we gotta get him out of it. like we gotta medevac him. And so now we're dealing with that whole piece. I'm up on the roof still. Guy comes up. He's like, hey man, medic comes up. He's like, hey man, let me check you out. Make sure you're good. I'm like, dude, I'm good. I don't know what it was. And you know, jokes start. It's like, oh, Woody got shot, but didn't get shot. You know, it's like he's hit. And uh, we eat, we coke and joke and laugh about it, but uh, Mike, he's down there. Somebody comes up. He's like, "Hey, dude, he is high AF. You got to get down there. He's funny." And I was like, he, "He's good." He's like, I th- "Yeah, I think he's gonna be fine. He's joking around with us, but he's missing a bunch of teeth." <laughs> And it's funny because it's, well, I, is this your hey, OIC? My, this is my AOIC. AOIC. Yeah. He, uh, just dude, if everybody in the teams was like him, I, I don't know if I could ever leave. He was awesome, dude. Just a great dude, and uh, great personality, great sense of humor, stellar team guy. <clears throat> and he's like, you got to go down and joke, tease on, tease on him a little bit. It's like, all right, I'll go down and check on him. So this guy gets shot in the fucking face. Yep. And then five minutes later, he's down there joking around with everybody. Badass. Awesome. Holy shit. Yeah, he's a good dude. And um, so I go down, I'm like, Mike, where... <laughs> I'm sorry, dude, I am keep saying it. I'm like, Mike, where are you? He's like, I know where I am. With my best friends, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you are, buddy. Yeah, you are. And uh, he's just an awesome guy, man. And and so it, the day continues. This crazy fog rolls in. Morning comes. So hold, hold still, on, hold sorry. on. Sorry. So what the hell hit you? Yeah, a bullet. It was so the something. bullet that went through his face. Hit you in the chest. So I heard like a. 
ping, like a zip, a ping. And there was a ton of rebar in this building that was in front of us. I think what may have happened was it hit a piece of rebar, fractured, I got hit by some kind of like small piece of shrapnel or something, I don't know. And then he took, he took the, the big piece, you know, or something. I don't know, man. But I don't know, how do you describe it? Something hit me, I don't yeah. know. In the plate? And it was like right above my plate. Shit. Yeah, couldn't find anything. Little red mark, but there's nothing. Crazy man. I don't know. Who knows what it is? Maybe I'm. <laughs> maybe I'm just being dramatic. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I don't know. Something hit me. So. So I'm like. Everybody's we we brought this like portable propane tank with us and we there's like a little skillet that we'd bring. Somebody brought some eggs to us, one of the uh Iraqi guys or something brought some eggs. I don't know. And I was sitting there like cracking some eggs. About to eat. My LPO's like, Hey man, need you up on the roof in a second. He said we might break down and, and go to a different spot. I said, Okay. Walks out the door. I hear, medic. I'm like, what? All of a sudden, two guys come in, pull him in, and he's like, my arm. You know? I'm like, dude, two? <laughs> Shit. And uh, they start getting him checked out. He had a through and through in his, in his right arm. It's like, all right, we're breaking it down. So. I guess we're yeah, we're breaking it down. Where do you where do you need me, coach? So we just start breaking things down, moving houses. We get both of them evac. One of them has to go through some serious surgery, gets sent home, and M has like two days. He's got to let his bleeding stop and like some gaps in his teeth scab a little bit, but he's right back out there with us. Two days later, yeah, back on the op. Yeah, man. Fucking so bad. That's kind of like, that's kind of what it looked like. And and don't get me wrong, like there are, there were days that were super boring. There are days like that that are kind of more eventful. And I don't want it, this to sound like the most. It what it. There are parts that were disappointing. There are parts that I'm proud of. But it's my deployment. You know, it's kind of like that was my experience general experience with well with it I don't know what were you most proud of uh, by the time we by the time we ripped out February around February I think mid January the entire eastern side of Mosul had been like cleared essentially and dude the Iraqis did the hev heavy lifting like they really did, and they were taking heavy casualties. I think the projection was by the there was a big lull halfway through. And I think it, ISIS was much more fortified than we we had anticipated. Go figure. And <clears throat> I th there was a projection that the initial force that started the push by the time that we cleared the entire eastern side of the city would be at 5%. Bam. Yeah. Do you have any idea so, how many how many bombs you dropped? On that deployment? Yeah. I, I, I can't. I couldn't count. Like Under. more than, more than I, yeah, maybe, probably. Probably. Uh, yeah, it just depends, like some of them, and like not every single one of those were on people. It might, have, dude. I don't know because there's other work. Like there's CCTs with us, so I wasn't doing all the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. We do we do shifts. So it was sometimes it was just a planted V bid that we found parked on the street. Nobody's in it. You know, you bomb it, or a tunnel system. You'd be striking it, or sometimes you'd find. A cave and a dude that was just shooting at you or your little cardboard airplane would run into it you couldn't get air another dude would run into it with an AK 
five, six more dudes would run into it with an AK. Your aircraft comes in, you're like, perfect. Thanks for piling up all your buddies for me. You know, and you'd strike it and you'd see a bunch of secondary and stuff blowing up on the inside of the mountains. So you knew that there was storm stuff in there. And uh, sometimes it was just blowing up cave entrances, yeah. shutting, shutting down their, their ability to maneuver. Dude, what's crazy is some of these caves, they would they'd use car batteries and bring out tools to dig these things. And I remember one time going or looking on ISR and just seeing this pile of dirt outside this cave. And they had just built up this like fortified position outside the entrance of this thing. There's all these big white rocks. I was like, dude, that is like a, that is Helm's Deep, man. That is, that's a, a base, you know, that yeah. they had built. I was like, that's a really bright white rock. I wonder. And, you know, I go on Google Earth and I look and I zoom out on this mountain range and dude it's like white rocks white rocks white rocks white rocks white rocks and I'm like go to this coordinate slew over cave entrance go to this coordinate cave entrance I'm like all right label targets you know one two three and you're building a whole target package on all these cave entrances just shutting them down thanks Google yeah so crazy, <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, you use the tools that you can, that you, that you can. Yeah. Um, but I, dude, I don't know how many. I don't, I don't think it was quite a hundred. Well, what are? But yeah, you know, it's it it it, a lot it, between all of us. Yeah, it, it, it was easy. Yeah. Um, easy. Um, a lot of tech. A lot of what? A lot of tech. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it really was. Uh, it was busy. It is everything's condensed. You're in these small buildings, and you're just kind of like, it's confusing. Why weren't you guys working at night? Because none of our partner force had knots. Okay, they couldn't. There's just it wasn't possible. Oh, I'm just curious. For them. There were there were gunfights at night, but they it would have been awesome to be able to maneuver and move around. And we did most of our moving at night, but for them. Their fighters were just, they just wanted to fight in the day. How about uh, ISIS? Were uh, they, they well equipped? They were very well equipped. Was it all our stuff? Oh, yeah. That we left there? A lot there? of it. And, uh, you know, you'd find ammo cans with foreign Asian writing and stuff on it. I don't know if that's actually where they get all their ammo, but I'm, I assume yeah. that they were getting a lot of stuff. And they're resourceful, man. They were making their own chemical weapons. They were making their own chemical weapons? Yeah. So, you, you know, you get mortared, you see a lot of times it's just like the, the the dust cloud, a little black smoke. And when it's chem, it's always just big yellow cloud. And luckily it wasn't very, like, concentrated because it dissipates quickly. And the rounds that they were lobbing at us weren't, or at least those chem rounds weren't very effective, so... It never got so close that we were, we were actually, like, ripping on our masks. There were a couple close calls. We're like, all right, I'm gonna put my mask in my pocket no. in case this one gets. It's getting a little uncomfortable. They're really walking them in on us. But I mean, yeah. in the intel briefings that you guys were getting, were they telling you, you know, what they were equipped with? That they have all of our, our old equipment that we'd left there. Oh, everybody, we already knew. You already yeah, know. we we already knew. You're seeing tow missiles. Guys are they're shooting anti aircraft, um, Gustav rounds at helos. Damn. And yeah, so that was a great gas platform that we got to use a lot. Was the Apaches? You think we would have learned a no. fucking lesson? We don't. But look at us still doing it, man. Yeah. Did you see them like with our vehicles and? Suburbans, Humvees, night vision. Not not so much vehicles because though they had built all these tunnel systems in the city and so they were maneuvering mostly by foot. Okay. So if they were if they were in a vehicle it was a V bid. Okay. Yeah. And that was all, most engagements and fights that we got into it was like always initiated initiated by V bid. Okay. 
So you, if the, you hear a V-bid clock off, so like something, okay, well, we're going that way. But they were built, they were, see, when I was over there, they, I mean, V-bids, and I mean, it was always, it was always a threat, but they, we didn't, we weren't worried about armored car bombs yeah. coming after you. Were they all kind of, were they all yeah, armored? They look like Mad Max vehicles. Damn. Yeah, all of them, every single one of them. They had like factories built there. Just to produce V bids. I can try to get you some some pictures and stuff. I'll send you some stuff. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, so the V bid thing and then they had also booby trapped, IED'd like most buildings. You know, most like, the like, majority not, of buildings. Not most buildings, but like a lot of buildings yeah. had IEDs in them. Shit. And so our EOD guys were freaking busy, man. They were busy. There was always like, there's always something. Like, hey man, you gotta go over there and check out that. There's like a boot over there that looks weird. And you go over and there's a boot and there's like mortar round laying there. Damn. You know, strapped up or dude, it was con- like constantly dealing with the IED thing. And and luckily the part our partner force was really good at identifying them. So it'd be like, that's an IED or like, hey, we need you get like we have an IED over here. So they kind of like point us most of the time in in the direction we'd find them but we try to like if we try not to be the ones to step on them if, yeah. if they could you know let them you need to let them fight for the country because as soon as we get super involved like they'll let us they know they'll just we'll get into it and and they'll let us do all the work yeah so you, you there's like this give and take right like you want to be helpful you want to contribute and you want to provide support but you don't want to come in so aggressive that they're like, oh, the Americans are going to do it now. Yeah. You know? So it's kind of a weird balance that you have to, they have to work with. It's hard to have and that the, kind of discipline. Dude. Yeah, it is. Because you want to you be the first dude. You want to get after it. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, let's take a quick yeah. break. We just got done with a hell of a fucking deployment fighting ISIS in Mosul. You're on your way home, so let's pick up right there. Yeah, so maybe backtrack a little bit why we were on this deployment. You're always kind of talking about what's the next step in your career. What is the platoon doing next? Where are you going? And you hear rumors about... you. Like, well, who's staying in the platoon? Who needs to go somewhere else? Who's going? Who wants to go to shore duty? You know, who wants to do another platoon? They start asking you these questions. Well, I don't know if I mentioned, but 10 days before my first deployment, um, before I deployed the first time, I had my firstborn son. And 10 days deployed, came back, kind of learning how to be a father. And then, you know. How old was he when he got back? I guess what like six six months. Were you guys guess, doing six guess. month deployments? Yeah, it was a six month deployment. We did rip out early, so it was it was shorter than that. But um, he was around that age. So about like five five, f- five f- months between five and six months. Damn. Yeah. So coming home to my little five month old buddy or six what four or five six seven eight, however old he was at the time, he um, coming back. So I'm learning to adapt to. You know, a whole new dynamic in my marriage. My wife had kind of developed a system, and now I'm stepping on that. And <clears throat> so I have my firstborn three months before my second deployment. I have twins. So yeah, you're drowning, and somebody hands you two babies. So now I got twins. Luckily, I got to spend some good time with them before I deployed. Come back. I'm, I'm fixed. I've had I've had my experiences. My wife's had her experiences dealing with, you know, hearing what's going on on a deployment, especially all the injuries, 
kind of you know guys kind of coming back lost in our platoon and so I'm having this conversation with my command on what I want to do next and my wife's having this conversation with me on what she kind of wants to do next and it comes down from the head shed that hey it's looking like we might split your platoon up and shed some of this experience to the other platoons and I remember hearing something along the lines of and you guys will probably go to the PI because we need to share the love right you we want to get other guys experience on these deployments and I was like man like if I deploy this is what I want to I want to be doing this stuff yeah you know I don't want to I don't want to if I'm going to leave my kids and my wife again I need it I, I want to go for a purpose and not that what you guys were doing in the PI is, doesn't serve a purpose it's just like it wasn't the work that I wanted to do at the time so I'm having this talk with my wife and she's like you know, bouncing babies and like screaming she's like hey so uh, you know do you do you think maybe you'd be interested in doing a shore duty instead <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like yeah, let me see what let me see what's out there and I had a couple buddies that I'd worked with on my first platoon. Um, my sister platoon chief was a second phase platoon chief, or second phase chief. And I kind of called him up and emailed him, and we had a good chat. And he's like, hey, man, if you if you want to come to Bud's, it's a great opportunity. The work schedule's more balanced. You can kind of get your, your home life in order, learn how to be a dad, and... and it's a great it's a great job and a good way to get back to the community and kind of come full circle with your career to this point. I was like, all right, you know, I think I can do if I did a shore duty, I do my I try to cut it I do it as short as I could, get my home life in order and get to spend some time with my kids, getting to know them, build a relationship with them and uh and then I'd be able to go back to the platoon. And, and probably I'd be able to see what the different teams were doing, what the different platoons were doing, and maybe kind of like jump in on a platoon that's deploying somewhere interesting. And none of that went as planned. <laughs> so you get home <clears throat> and I look at these kids and I'm not the dad that I thought I, I pictured I'd be come back from deployment and you tell yourself like you know I've had this experience I did a good job but for some reason my patience level and my frustration and my mercy and grace that I expect to have with my children is just like not there you know I feel completely disconnected from them I'm always angry. I have no patience for my wife. And I'm like, this isn't the dad I want to be. You know, like, this isn't the marriage I want. And and you're like, what? Like, why? Why don't I want to be home at all? I just want to work. Like, I want to be, I'd rather be a second, like, I'm going to try to, be at second phase as much as possible you know I just like focus I want to have all like work dives and stuff and come home from a job no patience for my kids short tempered raise my voice way way more than I should and you know we kind of talked about that yesterday at dinner it's just like man I wish I was I wish I was more patient with them how old was your oldest at that time so he was born in 2014, and this is 2017 for so like three, so three and years. A half, yeah. And dude, I have like no pay, like for a three year old, bro. I'm like, and I'm like, something not, something's not right here. You know, yeah. I need to talk. Like, my wife's telling me I'm super angry all the time. I'm like, what? Well, I don't know. I'll just, I'll appease her. I'll go talk to the psych. And that way, at least she knows, like, I'm get. Hey, I'm talking to somebody, you yeah. know. So I go into the psych and we start talking, and I'm just like telling him, kind of explaining like what I'm, I am to you, and I'm just like sobbing, you know, like I don't love my kids. 
I'm never happy at home. And he's like, dude, this happens way more than you think. And I'm like, I, lock it up, man. Like, I don't, like, I'm not supposed to be like this, you know? And <clears throat> I'm crying and, and I'm like, why aren't we talking about it? You know, like, why aren't we talking about like our home life and working this stuff out in our community? So how, how prevalent is divorce? And how many guys you like hear rumors or these stories about, but like nobody ever talks about it. Yeah. Nobody. And um, and it was nice because for the first time, I feel like I got to like kind of get back into a community. I got to start talking to some, like get some mentors that weren't in the teams. You know, guys in my church that were like I considered like very wise. And I remember one of them telling me, he looked at, I, I was explaining these feelings that I was having. And like, I was like, oh man, I can't be, like, I'm not really an angry person. I'm not an angry person. I'm just, I don't, I can't like navigate my home life for some reason. And I'm just trying to hack it. And he's like, let me tell you something. There's this guy named David. You know, the guy that killed Goliath, right? He's telling me about the story with him and Nathaniel. And he he tells us, Nathaniel's telling David this story. What had, just, what had just happened was is David had had an affair with one of his soldiers' wives. And he had sent his soldier off on pretty much a suicide mission to die so that he could take Bathsheba, you know, this woman. And he had told Nathaniel this story. And Nathaniel's like, let me tell you this story. And he said, there's a shepherd. And he has one sheep, and he takes care of it, and he, he eats at his table, and he, and he and he bathes it, and it like you know it sleeps in his bed, and, and he loves this sheep, and he's like, and there's a rich man, and he has a huge flock of sheep, and you know, he has more than he needs, and he you know he takes care of them, but when it comes time to sacrifice one of them, he steals the sheep of the other man. And he slaughters him and keeps his sheep safe. He's like, what do you think of this man? He's like, oh man, he should repay him, you know, hundredfold. And you know, cursed is this man. And Nathaniel leans in and he looks at him. And he's like, you are the man. Right? He's not like, you are like him. He said, you, you know, this isn't like a situation that you're in. It's like, you are the man. And... And to me, what that said is like, dude, I can say that I'm not an angry person all I want. I can say I'm not selfish. And I can't say that. I can say that like, you know, I can balance my family life and this like desire for ownership in my community and, and my obsession for my, rep, my reputation and the teams. But like, I am an angry man, right? Like this is something that I've, I've done and... And it's affecting my family, right? And if and if in my ownership of the community and in doing this job that I love, I destroy the thing that I'm trying to protect, hmm. like what needs to change, right? Like if in, in protect, in it, and if going out to these places, I'm, I'm claiming that I'm protecting my family. And I'm protecting those that I love, but I, but when I come home, I'm destroying it. What, how do I? How do you balance that? You know. And so that's kind of like, it's like I need to set. I need a lot more work than I thought I'd need for my family. And I'm like, I love, I love these kids. I love my wife. And I need a, I need a reset, right? <clears throat> and I, I feel, I know, and I know that there are great guys in the community that have awesome families, you know, and they make it work. But I just felt like a, there was this level of obsession for me that I was like, I just want to keep going and doing that job. But I could see that I was, it was damaging my home. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so 
I knew if I go back to the platoon and I start chasing that again, it's just gonna it's gonna get worse at home. And I don't and I don't know how to balance. I don't know if I'm I have the self control to to balance it. You know, so I felt like I really just had to kind of make a choice. And it's it's it a it's a tough line, you know. It it really it is. Man. On one hand, you you're feeding a, an addiction, you're feeding an obsession. You love what you do. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you're destroying everything at home, and then the same you know the same token, you justify it because you're doing what needs to be done for the best of the country. Yeah, you know what I mean, and and so. You have that to carry with you to to justify why you want to go back more, 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 and yeah, it it you know it just it's a cycle, man. It never ends. Yeah, it's It's never going to be enough. You you can have you can do the coolest hostage rescue mission in the world and you'll want to do another one. Yeah. And that's something that I feel like I had a taste, uh, like a good taste of combat, right? In, in Iraq. And I think a lot of guys, if I, they hear this story, they'd be like, dude, I just, I would like a deployment like that and I'd be good. And I'm like, no, you will not. No. Yeah. You will always want more. Like, you always want more, man. And, and I recognize that in myself. I'm like, how much of this is actually about me doing this job as opposed to me just being selfishly wanting more? Yeah. Right? And you have to get real with yourself. And I'm like, okay. Like, I'm checking myself a little bit here. And so I have a conversation with my wife. It's like, you know, hey, I'm going to look around and see what it looks like. And I'm going to start to, I'll talk to some people, but I don't know if I can get out. Like, I don't know if it's, I don't know if there's anything else for me, you know? Because every, <clears throat> every team guy that gets out, I, I, not, I say every, it's an exaggeration perhaps. I know a lot of guys know something that they want to do, and so they switch and they get out. Like, I want to be a doctor now, so they, I want to be an astronaut. Um, but I think for a lot of guys that feel that calling, that pull to like, maybe it's time to do something else, they have a really hard time finding something that they're as passionate about as they did when they knew that they wanted to be a Navy SEAL or they wanted to like do great things for their country, you know? And so for me, is I was thinking, you know, if I can find something like that, like. Like, I'll put my hands out there, and if God puts something there, then, like, like I'll, I'll take the sign, you know? But it's like, I just don't know anything. So we can talk about it, but if there's nothing that comes our way, so I'm, I guess I, I'm, I have to provide for my family, too, you know? I can't just get out without a plan and yeah. mess everything up <laughs> even more. Because now I'm miserable, right? And working a job I hate. I haven't figured anything out. But, uh, so I start instructing, doing this instructor deal. And I was driving a bus or something. And I remember I back, like, I backed up and I kind of clipped a vehicle, um, some like random parked car, and that was like parked in the middle of the road or something. And I went over, looked at the vehicle. The taillight was busted. Found the guy. I was like, hey, man, I I hate your car. And he's like, oh, dude, don't even worry about it. I think that it's pretty messed up already anyway. It's like, okay, cool. I went back. You know, I'm doing damage control. I'm like, all right, I don't want, I want the master chief to know. I want my chief to know. Start reporting to him. I'm like, hey, chief, just want you to know I clipped a car. I'm going to write a little report for you. What happened? Just so, like, if... You know how crappy that stuff was. With G- yeah. Like, like the what is the vehicle debt? They get super poopy pants if they hear something or a report or whatever that they didn't know about. So I go to the master chief's office. I'm like, hey, master chief, just want to let you know, I had a little fender bender. Guy's totally cool with it. I'm writing a report for it. 
I'm gonna let um, transportation know. Um, base security knows. It's all clear. And he's like, "All right, man, cool, thanks." And I look over on his desk, and he has this like sick trident statue. You know, it's a big old like kind of bronze eagle, and his wings are wrapped. And he has this. He's holding a trident and a flintlock, and I was like, "That's a sick statue." And I left his office. I was like, man, that's really cool. I wonder where he got that thing. It's like, I can never have a... Some, I don't have a place for a statue that big. I said, but I wonder if I could draw it or paint it or something, you know? I've been like kind of thinking about getting back into a hobby. It's like, I'm going to try... I'm going to try painting it, you know? I don't know. It was just like this thing in my mind. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back into some painting or something and on the way home I swung by Hobby Lobby bought a bunch of acrylics bought a little canvas while my wife is watching Netflix I'm googling like eagle picture like finding a trident and the anchor and I'm just kind of like hodgepodge draw this thing out I paint this picture and yeah it was like two nights of watching Netflix or something and I kind of hold it back Dude, I painted a picture, you know, and it felt like awesome. Like I made something and I showed my wife. She's like, that's pretty good. You know, I was like, thank you. It's like the cat that killed a bird. You know, it's like proud of the little bird that it killed. I'm like showing my wife, yeah. sending a picture to my, you know, my buddy, my dad. I'm like, nice work, man. That's sick. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to bring it in the office. I'm going to put it in the office. So I... Stick it to my office table. As I'm sticking it there, when my other instructor buds walk in and he's like, "That's a sweet picture. Where did you get that?" I'm like, "I painted that." He's like, "You painted that?" I said, "I painted that." You know, he's like, "Bro, that's pretty good." And somebody hears us out in the hall. And he's like, "Who painted something?" And I was like, "I painted this picture." He's like, "Dude, I want one." I said, "Sorry, man. There's only one." And he's like, "Well, let, let me get a print." I was like, uh, what do I do for that? It's like, well, you get a nice picture of it, and then you can hire somebody, and they'll print out like a high-quality photo of it. I said, okay, okay, I'll do it. And I was like, just pay me whatever it costs to print it. He's like, all right, I'll pay you more than that, man. I was like, no, just, you know. So I take a picture of it, I print it out, <clears throat> and I give, you know, I bring it in the office. He's like, here's 100 bucks, man. I was like, what? He said, yeah, dude, take it. I'd pay you more. I said, dude, thanks so much. That's really nice. You don't have to pay me $100, bucks, 100 dollars bill, you know. I'm like, thank you. He's like, dude, take it. He's like, I'm not taking it back. I said, okay, thank you. Put it in my pocket. Another guy comes in. We're kind of like talking about the picture. And he's like, where did you get that picture? And the tried. <laughs> I'm like, I painted it. And he's like, he painted this. He's like, he's like I want one. <laughs> you know? And so, dude, before you know it, it's like the team guy, Grapevine, and I have like a stack of these things at my house. And it, it, well, he's like, well, how much are they? And I look at him. He looks at me. I'm like, 100 bucks? He's like, all right. You know? I'm like, all right. So I started printing. Dudes are come to me. They're like, hey, you're the guy selling the, the Trident pictures? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you really painted that thing? I said, yeah, I did. I'm like, nice, man. He's like, I want one. And then, you know, the wives are, like, trying to pick them up for their husbands or seeing them at parties or something, reaching out on the wives, you know, little pages and stuff. And so I start kind of selling these things. And one day my wife's like, hey, this lady just bought one. And she said her husband's, like, Master Chief or something. And uh, I'm like, dude, that's Master Chief so-and-so. I was like, oh, shoot. And what was he like, the master chief of, of the command? Yeah, he was. Well, yeah, he was master chief of buds, and then he switched over, and he was like they were looking at him for like Mick Pond, master chief of the navy. Yeah, master chief petty officer of the navy. Oh shit! Yeah, so he's like kind of a big deal in the community. Yeah, I was like shoot, dude, what's this guy gonna think? And dude, that day, I hear. Knock, knock, knock at the door. Look out of my kitchen. And he's at my front door. And I'm like, oh, man, here we go. I'm in trouble. Or so, like painting these, I don't know. 
I don't know what I did wrong, you know. And I'm like, all right, go over. Open the door. I'm like, hey, Master Chief. He's like, are you Hughes? I said, yes, Master Chief. He's like, you painted that picture, huh? I said, yes, Master Chief, I, I did. I said, did, did you get one? He's like, yeah, my wife just got one for me. He's like, can I come in? I said, yes, Master Chief. He steps in. He's like, dude, that is bad ass, man. And I'm like, whoa. You know, I was like, you like it? He's like, yeah, man. He's like, what? He's like, have you always been able to do this? I was like, dude, I started drawing, and this is like the first thing I've ever painted. He's like, you got to do something with this, man. I said, you think? He's like, yes. He's like, you need to do something with this painting thing. I said, well, thank you. It's like, what else are you working on? I'm like, well, I just started this painting of the Dell. You know, check it out. He's like, that's amazing. He's like, dude, I don't know what your plans are. But if you ever get out, you got to do something with this pain stuff. And I was like, it clicked. It's like all my childhood drawing, you know, it, my experience in the teams. It's like, dude, I got to do something with this painting thing. You got that painting? I got the paint. Can I? Yeah. Now it's time to show it. Yeah. Think? Let's see it. So this is it, man. I don't know what the I don't know what the best camera angle is, or if people could see it. But uh, yeah, man, it was like you know, kind of threw it to get, uh, like turned out way better than you'd think, right? For a dude's first painting. So that painting basically represents a life changing event. Yeah. It's like this is where it all started for That's me. That's incredible. Man. And. uh yeah, dude, it set me on a freaking crazy path. That uh, is awesome. Definitely a lot of, I mean, yeah, dude, it's crazy. It's a blessing. Like, I can't, like, I don't know where this stuff comes from. Like, the only thing I think is, is you know, in my worldview, the way I view it is like, dude, this is like a gift from God for me, you know? And it, I felt so blessed that I was like, dude, I have a direction. You know, now what, now what do I do with it? Like, how do you become an artist? And do I say I want to be an artist? Like, is that a real thing? Like, I don't really, what does an artist as a team guy look like? I can't talk about being a Navy SEAL and be an artist. You know, that's not, that's taboo in my community. It's like, I don't think I can make a living off of this. I don't think any, can you make a living off of being an artist? Like, what is it? Like this whole world opened up to me. Yeah. That. I was suddenly interested in. <clears throat> and, you know, I whispered to my wife, I'm like, maybe I could paint or do some kind of, something artistic. Well, like, uh, why don't we get into some of that right now? Let's yeah. see what your work is. All right, so this is the first masterpiece that no. you painted. And um, <laughs> so just real quick, I just wanted to, Tell the audience, you know, I picked this picture. This was a real tough decision uh, for me because there's so, I got a ton of good pictures and I wasn't, it was either this one or there's one of me in a helicopter, yeah. like looking out in Afghanistan. That's a good one too. But, which is actually, I think, a better photo. But I picked this photo because I think this is a very good kind of story description it's a good visual of of what goes on mm -hmm. on a seal mission at least the ones i've been on yeah you know and i'm just being like totally yeah. honest here but this is like your typical sniper hide you know we did my platoon we did a lot of sniper stuff in baghdad and 90 percent of it is Actually, 99% of it is being bored, watching a target, keeping each other awake, fucking cracking jokes, playing grab ass. That's exactly what's you happening know, here. And 1% you know? and of it is actually killing bad guys. Mm -hmm. You know, And so I just, I thought this was like the perfect depiction of what happens. You know, mm -hmm. I got our AW here, automatic weapons guy. He's literally grabbing my ass, trying to get me to smile yeah. for the photo. I'm looking back at the camera. My other sniper partner is taking the picture. <laughs> this guy. I still keep in touch with this guy. 
and he's yawning, probably getting ready to fall asleep. There's gear, you know, around, helmet with nods on over there. This is Rifle. whoops, gun. <laughs> Have to bleep that. Beep. But um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's you know, this is just this is how it is. Nobody's watching the target. <laughs> And yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, nobody's yep. watching the target, which is back here. It's a moment. And uh, and this screen, you know, this screen is basically, it's it's concealment. You know, it's, yeah. you can't really see through that looking from afar, which means nobody's gonna think anything suspicious. And it doesn't look like a screen's just hanging there. It just looks like shadows, yep. you know, from a distance. But I just, you know, I thought that was a good depiction of what a SEAL operation is. And it's it's a lot of dark humor, a lot of grab ass, a lot of Dude, keeping exactly. each other awake and everything I just described. And, and man, you just painted it perfectly. You know, once it, I wanna put up the picture, that it, the actual picture that I yeah. sent you, and this looks 10 times better good, right? than the picture that I sent you. The picture I sent you was all washed out, mm -hmm. overexposed and we made it a little bit more dramatic. Yeah, for sure. But it's all, I mean, the the detail, the, it's just, I mean, the brick, the right, everything. Yeah. You can even tell, I mean, the camera Thanks. picks up on facial recognition. <laughs> Thanks. Man. You know, and this guy right here, like, it, the faces are just, it's insane. Thanks. I man. mean. Thank you, man. But just tell me a little bit about painting it. Yeah. I mean, so for me, first looking at this image, you know, resonates and it was really cool just to capture this moment where, you know, this is team guys always find a way to kind of like coke and joke and find the positive in like kind of a crappy situation. So it's just cool to kind of capture and paint like the dynamic of moods, right? Because you're a little bit more like this is like a more of a dramatic pose. You're hunched over. You're looking back at the camera, almost candid, right? And it's like you're just catching the side of it, and these two guys are like, kind of getting you, getting you in the picture. And it's just this moment that seems like it's so, that it's so improv, right? And then painting it, man, dude, it was a, it was a grind on this one, just because of the amount of detail. Right, and everything from the bricks to the drapery over his legs to the camo pants, man, the boots. It's like the rocks, the backpack, the gosh daggum see-through mesh, you know? And I, you, I don't know if you can probably see it on the camera, but you perhaps saw it in the picture. It's like there's vehicles driving in the background here. Yeah. And uh, just as an artist, it was very challenging to capture that without like losing the detail right because the temptation is just kind of like oh, i'm just going to paint it one color kind of paint these vehicles and then i'll like mix it mix mix up some kind of mesh design but just really doing the picture justice and what you guys were doing up there was like really important to me so just capture as much of it as i could and that was the goal setting out and i think uh i think it turned out pretty pretty daggum good yeah i'm pretty proud of it man it's awesome. i'm proud of it I mean, yeah. I didn't even do it. I'm proud of it. And I, I, everybody that comes in here, I'm like, look at this. Look at this shit. <laughs> Thanks, and, uh, man. Can you believe this guy painted this? He's only <laughs> been painting for a year. Yeah. And uh, it's just, I mean, and it's cool. It tells, it tells, to me, it doesn't get any more accurate than this with, with the detail and the story behind it. It's just, it's just incredible. Yeah. Story, so, man. That's what it's all about. Let's move on to the next one. So I gave you this picture. This is me at CIA. This is Yemen. And I just thought it was really cool because it's in the moment. And this is at a cot market. Those mm -hmm. of you that don't know, cot is like cocaine in Yemen, <laughs> supposedly. And, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it just, the detail you did on this is phenomenal. Thank I can you. see the outline of my gun right there. And... You know, a lot of people think working for the agency that you you blend in perfectly with the right. populace, you know, no matter where you're at. And that's just not the case, yeah. you know. And so 
a lot of it's finding a different cover to work under, whether you're a business guy, whether you're working for another government agency, maybe mm -hmm. you're an arms dealer, maybe you're a drug smuggler, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a guy with my skin complexion and tattoos and, you know, I'm not going to blend in. I don't yeah. speak the language. Even if I did speak the language, I'd have a no. horrible accent. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it would be worthless for me to kind of dress up like that and blend in and conduct espionage, you know? Yeah. And so I thought this picture kind of painted a more accurate. Yeah. Painted a more accurate, accurate picture. picture. Nice. Yeah. I like it. But, Paint um, humor of what it is, you know, over there and, <clears throat> and, and, you know, some guys do dress up in the garm. You know, I've dressed up in it too, but usually when you do that, it's kind of, you know, you're just trying to get by first glance. Maybe yeah, you're in a maybe exactly. you're in a in a car that's driving by quick. Yeah, you know, nobody's gonna pay. You know, it's just a quick glance, and nobody's yep. gonna notice the difference. But when you're out on the street, that shit is not gonna cut it because the minute you get stopped, and, and plus it's so cultural over there. Right. You know, the, we won't pick up on things like your like that knife that they carry over yeah. there, the jumbery yeah. yep. you know this guy it's right a, here it's tucked in you can see it yeah you, you carry you it the pay. wrong way and it's like a dead giveaway yep. it's like that guy definitely doesn't belong doesn't here. belong here yeah and so I mean, the way they wear this like the way they fold it and wrap it and tuck it it's all yeah it all means something me or you might not know yeah but they know they know and so and so it can it could be more detrimental to try to look like them than than like yep, that but, for sure <clears throat> but anyways how was it painting this man this one just compared to the other you can al you can already tell that there's elements to it that are much more not abstract but more impressionist right so you got like the these curtains here or like the the tent roofs you i mean just trash all over the ground you got these bags of cot and <clears throat> when you get an image that is a little bit more like there's a lot more white and less contrast between some of this, these elements. It gives you an opportunity as an artist to use a little bit of texture to tell the story instead of just, you know, on a digital image, it's just flat color, right? So it, as, as for, for me, it was a lot of fun just getting to mess with some of, the, some of those elements, right? Even in, in the texture in your, in your shirt here, or this guy's jacket. So, you know, you started out just painting kind of a monotone, color just getting everything in placement and then you build layer upon layer upon layer and and for this one especially compared to the last one I felt like I could cut loose a lot more and use my paintbrush and show some of those bolder paint paint strokes and it made it an absolute blast to paint and I mean there wasn't a moment when I was painting this that I wasn't like excited to get on the easel and and get to working on it. And like you said, dude, it's like so candid. The look is so similar to the other one, so it ties them together, you know? And the fact that it's you in two separate um, work environments is pretty, yeah. pretty rad, but you can see the similarity. Like if you put them side by side, like that's Sean Ryan, yeah. you know? And, and that's pretty sick. And just the, I feel like the cultural element too. Dude, it just it speaks a lot. It. It, can't, it like, there's so much there, man. Like that. It just seems so. Yeah, it seems Yemen. so natural. Yeah, that is like that is Yemen. Exactly. In the cop markets, this whole thing went up. Sick. Like right after that, I bought that too. Like, oh really? It was like yeah. some argument. It was like. <laughs> a little. But um, but, dude, I'm just like amazed at the. Thanks, man. At the talent and the detail, and it's just it's it's, it's incredible. Like cool. every time I look at this and the other one, it's just, it's insane. Thank you, that, Sean. That you're able to do that. Thank you. So, yeah, I want to put like the actual raw image of what I sent you on the screen right now. Yeah. So that everybody can see. So this is the raw image. This is the actual photo that he painted. And then, and then this, this is, is what he turned it with. into. It's, it's, it's amazing, dude. But yeah. which one Thank did you, you like? Painting more. Dude, I like different elements of each, right? So the first one, I loved that there were team guys in the picture. I love that there were some kind of trade craft elements with the screen. 
Um, dude, this kind of stuff's fun to paint. Like these faces are really cool, and I kind of get a bigger portrait of you, so that was really fun to paint. But I have to hand it to the other image. Is my I think it's my favorite. Like seeing them both here side by side. Yeah. I think yeah, it's just because like that seems like my group, you know. Yeah, and and maybe it's just because this wasn't my experience in Yemen as much. Like I, I got to go down to the cop markets and the weapon market and and dabble a little bit, but um, it wasn't as dynamic of a experience for me yeah. as it was for like my Yemen time was kind of like not as exciting. You I know? spent so, a long time. So there. I th- I see this and I'm like I can relate a lot more yeah. with that. You know, so it's kind sure. of I could see that. This is, this is, it's too, like, it, they're so similar, the yeah. two careers, but so, so different. It's wild how just deploying to two separate countries can co- totally change the operation, right? Yeah. And, like, completely change the dynamic um, of how you work, right? Yeah. Like, you're kind of doing the same thing, but it's completely different. It's, yeah, that and then and then just the difference from being a SEAL to oh, working yeah, for the agency. agency. It's yeah. like there's a lot of similarities, but you can't even compare the two because they're they're still so different. Yeah. But dude, once again, I nice. mean amazing work. Thank you, Sean. That's incredible. It was an absolute pleasure to do and thanks for trusting me with a part of your history. Well, thank you for for doing it. Well, Justin, your art is I'm just blown away by your raw talent. It's, I mean, it is, it's just fucking incredible uh, that that all came from that, that small trident painting. And now you've got stuff that's, I mean, there's not a doubt in my mind you're going to be in a museum, but what, so where are you going next? What's next for you? Um, Man, right now I'm working on my first real series of paintings and I, I kind of hope to be done with that by the end of next year. I have a couple commissions lined up that I'm really interested in, but uh, but really I'm trying to kind of take some of that that warrior archetype that I'm coming from and and seeing if I can translate that and tell, tell a story through another another medium. Right. And I think that with paint, sometimes it's hard to like, uh, like if I could write it or like if I could put a script together or something, I, I'd probably do it that way. But like paint is just my medium for storytelling. Right. And in passing legacy and, and telling history. Right. And so if I can do that for some of the guys in the community, uh, specifically guys that I've worked with, then that's kind of like the direction that I, that I want to head with my art. And so I'm kind of working on a series of paintings based loosely off kind of like what, what that looks like and to me and telling that story if I can. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Thanks, yeah, I'm really it's, excited about it. Your work is phenomenal. Thanks. And, uh, and I, I just, you know, well, I just want to say your journey just blew me away. The childhood stuff. Yeah. I Thanks. totally, I, I was not expecting <laughs> any of that. And I think that that could be an entire, I think that could be an entire episode in itself. And then to see how things have kind of come full circle for you. You know, you went from that to, I mean, which sounds like, in your childhood sound, it's like it was the life of a spec ops guy. And then you go into spec ops, you become a SEAL. Your deployments, you know, especially the one in, in, in mm-hmm. Mosul, yeah. where you're a JTAC fighting ISIS right on the front lines. I mean, that's... That's some heavy shit. And then to come home, get through that. I've I've been watching you. I interacted with you and your wife last night. Your kids seem really cool. And uh, I mean, you just got a great family life and the the art 
that you're producing is, or that you're painting is just, I'm just really happy for you, man. Thanks so much. You know, it's, it's really cool to see. I love watching people succeed and, and you've definitely found your passion and thank you so much, man. And, uh, I just, you know, it's a, it's, it's really cool to, to watch that. It's a blessing. Yeah. How thank can you. people find you? Uh, right now I'm most active on Instagram, Justin Hughes art. And I also have a website, Justin If you're interested in commissions, you can hit me up on messenger on Instagram messenger, or I have a little page on my website that is probably like the best section. Cause you can write more on, on what you're interested in having painted, but yeah, reach out to me, connect with me out there. I'm pretty active. All right. Well, once again, I just, it's, it was a real honor to interview you. I've been looking forward Thank to this you, for a long time, and, and that's quite the story. Thanks so much, Sean. Dude, it's an absolute honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. An honor to, you know, paint these pictures of you and, and create a legacy for your future generations, right? Your kids and, and help tell your story in a, in a different medium. Those will be passed down from generation to generation oh, in yeah, my family. No doubt. Yeah. It's crazy to think about. It's cool. Well, best of luck to you. Thanks, Sean. Cheers. Yeah.